G'day, welcome to the Matt Frad Show. How's it going? You look fan bloody tastic. Hey, um, in all seriousness, you do look good, but I will be interviewing uh, Father Gregory Pine today, Dominican friar, works for the Thomistic Institute, probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever chatted with. Um, amazing guy. We, we speak about God's existence, we speak about faith and reason, uh, we speak about morality, uh, we speak about discerning religious life and our vocation in general. Really terrific conversation, I think you'll find. Before we get into today's show, though, I want to say thanks to two sponsors that are super great and are helping this show happen. The first is Covenant Eyes. you got to get Covenant Eyes. Why don't you have Covenant Eyes? If you've got kids, you definitely need Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is filtering and accountability software. You see the sorts of things online, you know, that tempt you. Why wouldn't your kids see those things as well? Well, they do, and they're being tempted to look at them. If you struggle with pornography... This is what you need. Not only does it block the bad stuff, but it sends a report to people about your online activity so that you can be accountable. If you want to get a month free, go to covenantize.com and in the promo code, just write Matt Frad, one word, Matt Frad. And guess what? You'll get a month free. That's awesome. So if after day 29, you're like, I don't like this, you can cancel it. You don't get charged. Matt Frad is the promo code. Go to covenantize.com. When you buy it, use the promo code Matt Fred, I want to show you something that I haven't shown you before. This is a 30-second clip about their new uh, awesome technology that actually can tell by looking at the images on your screen whether or not you've been looking at pornography. Check it out. Screen accountability monitors your device by frequently capturing screenshots of your activity. Our artificial intelligence analyzes those screenshots for explicit imagery. But don't worry, the images are blurred to protect your privacy. Any concerning screenshots are compiled together into a report, along with a sample of other screenshots that show typical activity, which we send to a friend of your choosing. All right, the next people we need to thank is Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is like a spiritual boot camp for men. For 90 days, you give up awesome things, you know, like snacking between meals and sweets and alcohol. You take on things like cold showers, praying the daily rosary, but you don't do this as a sort of isolated experience. You do it with a whole brotherhood of people. You've got to check them out, Exodus 90. If you go to exodus90.com slash mattfrad and sign up that way, they'll send you three different exclusive videos uh, from me kind of encouraging you on how to embark upon Exodus 90. Check it out. This is a very manful way, I believe, of responding to the current crisis in the church today. Not to complain about it, but to actually begin to live the ascetical life. Exodus90.com and put in slash Matt Frad and uh, you'll get those three exclusive videos. Finally, I wanted to say, this hopefully will be the last time that we have this set because we're trying to develop a, we are actually in the process of developing a brand new Matt Frad show set. I mean, let's be honest, this kind of looks like in between two ferns, which is fine maybe, but a little too simple. Um, These videos cost a lot, but we're glad that we're doing them and we thought it's finally ready to take the plunge and make it look a lot better. So if you want to help us support, you know, help us uh, work towards that, please become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash mattfrad. You can give a dollar a month, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. I give you free things in return. Things like signed books, beer steins, Right, check that out, patreon.com slash mattfrad. Or if you hate Patreon, go to pintswithaquinas.com slash donate. Um, every dollar helps. Even if you can just give a buck a month, that really helps to, you know, doing all this work, filming these videos, building this new set. But really appreciate it. All right, God bless you. Enjoy today's show. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Nice thanks. to see you. It's a pleasure to see you too. <laughs> what time did you have to get up at DC, in uh, DC? I got up at 3.30. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's okay though. What time do you usually get up as a Dominican? Uh, it depends on the man. I ordinarily <laughs> get up at 5.15. Okay. It's just a is propitious that morning hour. prayer? Uh, morning prayer, well, morning prayer starts at 7, and then mass is to follow. Okay. So, yeah. But 5.15, you get time to kind of freshen up. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are interested <clears throat> in this. I am. What is it like walking through an airport dressed like you? What is it like walking like an airport dressed like me? Um, you yeah. know, some people... You know, like, would like to talk to you, but plenty of people would not like to talk to you. Do you think some people have no idea what you are? I suspect as it's much. It's not like the Roman collar, where it's unambiguous. Actually, I heard a man today, as I passed him, he said, um, well, he waved at me, and then as I passed, he goes, oh, that's ecclesiastical garb. 
Which made wow. me think, like, what did he think I was initially? Like, a wizard or yeah. a Jedi? Both of which are so good. So he waved first. He waved first. And then and realized. And caught himself, right? So if you think you're being greeted on account of your religious affiliation, that may not be the not case. Not necessarily so, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Was it awkward in the beginning and has it become less so? Um, you know, it, I, mm, hard to say. I think in the, like in the beginning, I was more conscious of how people reacted to the fact of my wearing a habit. Um, but like now, it's just kind of, it's kind of par for the course. And it's one of those things where like, in addition to being cool and evangelical because it starts conversations, sure. it's also, you know, it's penitential. Um, so it's just, yeah, you're, you're weird and that's okay. That's yeah. the kind of life you signed up for. All my eggs are in the, I'm weird for Jesus basket. So I hope it there pans must out. Have, there must have been a sense of excitement to receive the habit. Oh yeah, undoubtedly. And how long until you receive the habit when you um, go through formation? For Dominican friars, typically it's like two weeks. No. <laughs> yeah. Our postulancy is like two weeks long. You and know. then you get the habit? Oh yeah, you better believe it. Are you exaggerating two weeks? No, I would never exaggerate about that, no. So it's literally two weeks literally and they put weeks. a habit on you? I entered on July 25th and I was given the habit on August 7th. It doesn't feel like you've earned it. No, certainly not. Because it's a grace. Bingo. You set yourself up. <laughs> yeah, you okay, are. yeah, well done. Because <laughs> sometimes you see these guys who join religious orders and they've got to w wear the awkward slacks and big wooden cross. Yeah. Kind of earn your stripes before you get the cool thing. Right, yeah. And then for women sometimes they wear like kind of like blouse jumper skirt things. Yeah, that's the worst. That's what it is, but um, yeah, God love them. But yeah, we just kind of show up and look silly and unshaved and unhygienic. And then they say, be better and shaved and hygienic and we're like okay and they're like and here's the habit it's like wow. is it after the habit they want you to be more <laughs> clean cut <laughs> not necessarily they just want us to be grown up and a lot of guys coming from college and they're like yeah i shave like every fourth day yeah whatever yeah you well, know actually that's and and they say every day hey uh that was like one of our novice masters thing was like yeah this is like there's there's not going to come a point in your life where you like your boss is going to say you need to look this this way yeah there's no like business professional conversation coming down the line so it may as well be now not a lot of Dominicans have big beards. Do you reckon there's some people who started to think about the Dominicans, puberty kicked in and they went, nah, fries are the renewal. I think, so in the Dominican legislation, it used to be the case that you had to be clean shaven. The only guys who would grow beards would be the men who were going on the missions, yeah. uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and then in the Franciscan tradition, yeah, it's always been big beards are bust. Mm. So I think they, the reasons they list in the Capuchin legislation is that it should be like austere and masculine and ugly. I think it's like really. Yeah, I mean, like part of it is the. You have to look ugly. Yeah, I mean, that's done. Uglify yourself. I think that's. I could be mis. I mean, I could be misquoting. Sure. I haven't read their list. Got to speak on behalf of the Franciscans. <laughs> but yeah, no, they they own it for sure. Yeah, you know, I have some, you know, jealousy. Now, what do you think the best <clears throat> male religious habit is? Wow, bold strategy. The because Dominican. Do you really? Yeah. Let's. I want to show you, in case you haven't seen it, <laughs> the Franciscan friars. Uh, let's look at them here, friars. Of the renewal, because I actually discerned the fries for a while. Okay. And a big part of it was their habit was just awesome. Yeah. I was just with some fries two weeks ago. The guys from New Mexico were in Nashville preaching a big old conference at the Grand Ole Opry. The joy that they, these blokes have is just beautiful. Yeah, they're the real deal. I went and lived with them. Well, I say lived with them. I went and did a discernment thing with them in England. Okay. Actually, this looks like the same place I stayed in England. I might be wrong about that. It's Judging just, by the cabinetry? It's just cabinetry. <laughs> I might be mistaken. But, but yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's simple. It's also in one piece, which yeah. for those who wear a Dominican habit, it's in like three or four pieces. What are you wearing now, two pieces? So I'm wearing a tunic, <laughs> and I'm wearing a belt and a rosary, and then I'm wearing a oh. scapular, and I'm wearing a capoose. Holy moly. <clears throat> so in my father's house, there are many habit parts. <laughs> I go to prepare a habit Dominican for habit. Now... This is pretty cool. Do you know this guy? Uh, no, we haven't met. Do you think he's really a Dominican? I, th I suspect as much. He looks like he's Spanish-speaking, and that looks like a pretty convent, so I'd suspect that he's from, like, Spain. Oh, really? <clears throat> yeah, I know these blokes. Who, them? They're, they, they're part of my province. That's where we do our novitiate. Yeah, oh. some of these guys are in formation presently. Now tell us about the black uh, cape. Black cape. We call it a kappa, because that's a fancy Latin word for, you guessed it, cape. <laughs> but that's different from capuchin, which is capuche, right? Which has to do with the hood. Yeah, so it's all based off the same word. Okay. So the word in Latin is caput, which means head. And so like a capuche is what covers your head. And the reason for which, you know, people have ways of explaining stuff. Yeah. Uh, and usually it's, it's fine. But usually the, the way that these things come about is just as a result of practicalities. Yep. So contemplative religious have capuches because they need to cover their heads because they're always praying in churches in Europe that are cold and drafty. 
So that's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. Cool. Headscarf. But and different. in fact, this is where we get the word <clears throat> cappuccino. Bingo. Because the brown habit that the Italians wore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is the for, yeah, the forerunner of said delicious drink. Yeah. Sometimes frothy, sometimes frothy. Hey, we're going to look at one more habit. I, you know, I think the sisters of life have a better habit than the Dominican sisters. There you go. I just said it. Boom. Okay. I think, uh, why isn't it? State your reasons. I will. And I'm about to do that. Because you like the color blue. With a plum. Here we go. Okay, here's why the Dominican sisters, gosh, they're all so beautiful. I love sisters. (laughs) I've never met a sister I hadn't fallen in love with. (laughs) Um, Because it's the Dominican habit, but they added blue. She's Australian, I think. Is she? Yeah. That's why she's the prettiest. I just met her her in Toronto. Really? Yeah, she's a cool lady. Oh, Oh, she lives in Toronto too. I just met her recently. Sister Catherine Joy. She's sister something grace and I've forgotten. Yeah. But no, that is, that's the argument. It, they've taken the Dominican habit and they've improved it with the dark blue. You just think blue is better than white. Well, yeah, it adds some variation. You think the very, I mean, we have a black belt. I mean, like, check out this thing. This is like hugely variable. Well, let's look at the Dominican sisters. Dom in, ik. You said this was the last one. I know. You're a liar. Yeah, there's, no one's going to watch this show. It's fine. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're all gorgeous. This, this is, I don't know. This is either the greatest habit or the second greatest habit. Okay. Yeah. Because you're either, waffling. Do you I want am to waffling you? a little bit. The Sisters of Life, I think, is better than this, but I haven't fully decided yet. Because this me, is glorious. Practical considerations. Make the argument. The reason that white was chosen was because it was the cheapest material. It's undyed wool. Is that right? Yeah. So it's like eminently practical. It has no real like spiritual significance assigned to it, except after <laughs> the fact. Not purity, nothing like no, that. No, like you get that in yeah, like the subsequent tradition, but it's just like, yeah, this was cheap. Which is like the same reason that Mother Teresa chose her habit. When she was about, she was like with the Sisters of Loretto, and then she had this like profound experience that God was calling her to do something new. And right before she got on some, whatever, it was like a train or a plane or a blah, blah, blah. She had to, she had to like get a habit for her congregation. And she just went in the marketplace and she found like two saris that she could sew together that were the cheapest thing she could find. Is that right? Thus it was born. Yeah. yeah. So oftentimes it's a matter of just what's ready at hand. Well, that's why I, I heard that about the, fr- that's the argument for why the Franciscan habit was originally gray. Mm, yeah. Not brown because I, but wouldn't that be dyed if it were gray? Um, I don't know how things work, but I imagine I like dirty uh, lambs, sheep, sheep lambs, they probably come out gray. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, so when my, my wife actually discerned with the Sisters of Life. Oh, nice. Okay. And so whenever I see them, it's like meeting the boyfriend that I beat. Ah. Not really. That's kind of weird, but it is I support weird. you. Thank you. Yeah. How you doing? Uh, <laughs> I'm doing well, yeah. Good. How long have you been a priest for? I've been a priest for nearly three years. Yeah, eons. Ages yeah. and ages. And why did you, uh, why did you want to be a priest? How did, why, how did you join the Dominicans? <clears throat> why did I want to become a priest? Um... So I wanted to become a priest because I read about St. Thomas Aquinas. This is going to sound nerdy. No, I hope, I, it, okay. hope it does. Yeah, good. Okay, so I read about St. Thomas Aquinas, and I found, like, I wanted to love the Lord the way that he loved the Lord. How was that? Um, so with wisdom, um, with devotion, with, like, magnanimity. So, like, I guess in, like, high school, I, I never really had the desire to become a priest in a really concrete way, but I had a desire to be, like, perfect, you know? I wanted to be like the saints I had read about. I had a desire to be charitable. I wanted to be generous, and I realized that I wasn't, because any time my mother asked me to do anything, I wouldn't. Um, and I wanted to be a man of deep prayer. I wanted to be wholly given to the Lord. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to do great things that were, that were great, you know, that were worthy of a man's heart, um, because God calls us to such heights. And I just didn't see how those fit together. I just, I had, I had some vague sense that they were interrelated, but I didn't know how. And then, my freshman year of college, I heard a, a lecture given by um, a professor from St. Louis University, Eleanor Stump, who's mm-hmm. great. Yeah. And she spoke on Aquinas on the nature of love. And it just devastated me because she was describing, I mean, just describing the aspirations of the human heart in a way that I found especially beautiful and compelling. Because um, I'd had like some theology beforehand, but it was kind of eclectic. You know, I went to public school, I went to CCD, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I knew that like this holy person said that and this smart person said that and that like Jesus said this and it was like Catholicism. Um, but all of a sudden she's describing love in this very clear, articulate, eloquent way. And I found that it corresponded with what I had experienced, but it gave expression to what I had experienced far better than I could ever have. Um, and I was like, dude, I need to drink from this font, namely St. Thomas Aquinas. So I started reading about him, and then I read this book called The Quiet Light, which, truth be yeah, told, yeah. is like historical fiction and super charming and delightful. And then at the end of it, I was just like, yeah, I want to love the Lord like St. Thomas loved the Lord. So I hadn't met a Dominican friar apart from him, and I was just like, 
Yeah, party on. So thankfully the Dominicans still existed. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then you went and visited them in D.C.? Or? Yeah. Yep. So I had a friend uh, with whom I was at school, and he knew, you know, one of the guys from back home had joined the Dominicans. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to his diaconate ordination. You should come with me. And I did, and then I just kept coming back, and then... Hey, I imagine, like, religious orders, obviously, living throughout the centuries, there must be ebbs and flows to their awesomeness. Like, I'm sure they always go through interior reformations, yeah. and... It, it feels to me like it's going through a beautiful reformation. All the Dominicans that I meet seem super solid, uh, super committed, super in love with the Lord. Yeah. Would you say that's true? Or? I, I mean, it's just like we have a sense that God is giving us gifts and graces and men uh, to form for a reason. We have like a pretty profound sense of the responsibility that that entails because, yeah, they, they just keep coming. Um, and the Lord keeps using, you know, Dominicans as his shock troops. But if you ever, I mean... The trajectory of history is not one of constant increase, like you say. It's like yeah. up and down and up and down. And um, lest you think that, you know, like, or lest I think that it's the Dominicans are awesome always and everywhere. You just have to read in history and see our many faults. And yeah, yeah that kind of humbles you and keeps you close to the Lord. Now, is it true that the Dominicans were referred to as sheepdogs, protecting the sheep? I, so certainly dogs. dogs um, okay. So, like, in Latin, Dominicanes, if you break it out, it's Domini of the Lord and Canes dogs. Oh, I didn't realize that. And that's correlated with a vision that um, St. Dominic's mother had when he was uh, in, in utero, in the womb, mm -hmm. when he was cooking. Um, she saw in her womb, not a child in this vision, she saw a dog with a torch in its mouth that would run around the world and set it ablaze. Yeah. Uh, and at first it's like, wow, strange vision. Um, but then as it played out, he founded the Dominicans, the dogs of the Lord, they're preachers, you know, they illumine or otherwise enlighten the world by yeah. holy preaching, please God. Um, so it's kind of played out that way. And you often see St. Dominic pictured with a little dog and a torch in his mouth. I, I had always heard that, um, and I've got this beautiful painting at home. I want to see if I can find it here. Dominican sheepdog Thomas. Let's see if we can find something. Um, that they, well, no, that's definitely not it at all. Uh, Thomas Aquinas Heretics. There's some paintings of him. Here, this one. See that? Oh, wow, yeah. I, I heard that the Dominicans referred to as sheepdogs of the Lord who were defending the sheep from the wolves who were proclaiming heresy. Right. No, I could. We should go with that, even yes, if that's not true. That's a great, yes, I like that. Isn't that awesome? True. Look at that. That's you right there. <laughs> Just laying that, in that dude's neck. <laughs> I won't Looks say like that two is. ferrets at a pet store. <laughs> yeah. It's my favorite part about pet stores is when ferrets get locked in that death coil. When they're just like gnawing on each other's necks. Oh, I haven't seen and, it. Oh, it's awesome. I hate ferrets. Ferrets so are much. kind of dirty, but they're great to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, one of the reasons, one of the things that attracted you to the Dominicans was the uh, well, Thomas Aquinas yeah. and his emphasis on the harmony of faith and reason. Mm. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about are that. Are faith and reason actually compatible? Did you mm. ever go through a period as a teenager or a young adult where you weren't so sure that they were compatible? Um. I didn't go through a period like that. I never had like a crisis of scientific faith uh, because my parents were like, hey, this is Catholicism. And I was like, all right, perfect. And then I was like, all right, I guess this is Catholicism. And then from there I became a priest. So, um, but su like subsequently, because it is something that's, you know, especially prized or treasured in the Dominican tradition, I have come across a lot of arguments and a lot of lectures and a lot of, you know, things to read on the, sub on the subject. And I've become more and more convinced of it kind of downstream of mm. my formation. So it never really struck me as a problem because I, I went to Steubenville. So like 99.9% .9 of students there are Catholic and all of them are like basically pumped about praising the Lord. Yeah. So I wasn't like, you know, yikes, caught in the middle. I just, yeah, mm. it was always something that I just kind of imbibed. What do you think uh, most people mean when they say that uh, faith isn't, uh, can't, can't be reconciled with, with reason? They think that faith contradicts science. And I mean, this is probably something that most people many people think. Yeah, so I think it typically entails a caricature of faith and it entails a caricature of reason or science. Okay. So the caricature of faith is usually, um, it's associated with like fundamentalism. Mm. So oftentimes, we'll, you know, like you'll see folks who read the Bible, not literally, but literalistically. Um, so they'll read certain things. Make, make that distinction for those at home. With pleasure. So the Bible has a literal sense, which is to say that the words were intended by the author to mean something. Uh, when you read it literalistically, you take the meaning of those words and you make it as close to historical or kind of most base as imagined. Um, so like for instance, Genesis 1 through 11. Like you can read Scott Hahn and he talks about the language of Genesis 1 through 11 as kind of mythic. That's not to say myth in the sense of false, but myth in the sense of more true, like 
the way that Tolkien uses the word myth, right? So they're not to be, it's not to be read as strict history. And you have evidence in the Fathers of the Church, like in St. Augustine, of reading um, the creation story allegorically. Like St. Augustine says, all right, cheers. Um, day and night, right? So the first three days are measured by day and night, but the sun isn't created until the fourth day. Like, what's the skinny? Mm. Um, so he says, it's evident from this that we need to read this analogically. So this isn't like subsequent, you know, 24-hour days of creation. It's one act of creation, a kind of, you know, creation, separation, and adornment. <clears throat> but that um, it, it can describe a process of years. It can describe a process, you know, it's like it's supposed to communicate theological truth. Mm -hmm. That God is transcendent. That God is good. That creation is good. That evil is introduced by man, right? So like all of these things that would set Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 apart from like other near like ancient Near Eastern myths where those things aren't the case mm -hmm. like the gods are in the thick of it and the way the creation comes about is through violence yeah. and man is like just kind of caught in the middle of this you know cosmic strife and it's all like very grim and terrible um, so fundamentalism comes along in like the 19th century and it's largely an American phenomenon and says like this is to be read as strict you know 24 hour days and so you have like young earth creationists etc and I'm not like lampooning anyone but it's just to say that that's not a traditional Christian way of reading it, right? So this is often the notion of like reason that's, pro or excuse me, of faith that's propped up. It's like Christians turn off their brain and just accept what is quote unquote revealed to them. But truth be told, it's like an ongoing psychological delusion perpetrated by authority. It's like, yikes. Mm. And then the notion of science is also modern. So science has always been, you know, practice wherever there are men and women. Um, but in the 16th and 17th century, there was a kind of reaction to medieval and even ancient modes of scientific inquiry, whereas those would have been like geared towards wisdom and a certain kind of demonstration. Now science like kind of empties a lot of those considerations of their content. And what you're really concerned with is like stuff and force. You got matter and you got like efficient causes. And it's about mechanism, whereas, whereas formally you would take into account like the forms of things in the kind of classic platonic sense. Like, what is this and what makes it to be what it is? And then the ends of things, like, to what are they progressing? For what are they? Like, why have a tree? Is it to produce fruit? Is it to be beautiful? Is it to provide me shade? You would ask, like, kind of wisdom-oriented questions rather than, like, what is the chemical composition thereof? Um, so now science has been kind of, you know, not that's whatever. It's not to say that it's bad. It's just to say that it, it now only really takes into account, like, matter and force. And so it seems to be the case that you can explain everything in this world with matter and force. So you don't need any of those other occult causes. You don't need the God of the gaps. He's been forced off the scene. And so you have a false notion of faith and you have a false notion of reason and then you perceive a conflict between them. When truth be told, I guess this isn't how you would convey conflict, but more like this, <laughs> yeah. a synthesis conflict. Yes. Um, so whereas if you can reclaim uh, a more properly Christian sense of faith and a more properly humane sense of science, you can show that there isn't, yeah, there isn't conflict. Mm. Now, if there isn't a God, wouldn't mm. it follow that we can, we, we wouldn't, what are, the, what are the two causes we've done away with in, in modern science? I guess it would be what the formal and the final, mm -hmm. and all we're left with is what the material. And the efficient. And the efficient. So the efficient cause is what brought it about. Yep. Uh, the material is what the it's. stuff that makes it up. Yeah. Um, why, why is it inappropriate? to just explain the world through those two things. Like it sounds like you're assuming that, that maybe it was a legitimate thing to explain things through the formal and final cause, but maybe yeah. you're wrong. Well, I think, so you, you, people are always taking into account final cause, but they don't acknowledge it. So what they do is they smuggle it in as a kind of preconception or a kind of like ideological first principle, but by not acknowledging it, they're actually being deceptive and they're being more intransigent because it's not on the table. So like, for instance, if you read a biology textbook, you can't get very far without reading the words in order to, right? So you're always taking account of finality, always taking account of teleology. But if you don't really bring it to the table as something worthy of discussion, then all of that stuff is going to remain only partially developed and, you know, in, in part false because it hasn't actually been introduced into your inquiry. So, um, and so too of like formal causes. When you, when you like you talk about, like speciation, for instance, what makes a thing to be what it is? And then you could like talk about evolution as like a kind of progress of blind chance. That's in a certain sense, it's to fail to ask the questions that need be asked. And when you don't end up asking them, then you frustrate your study. Um, so like is evolution proceeding towards something, right? Is it proceeding towards man? You know, there are a lot of these like Stephen Barr will talk about anthropic principles. There are certain things on evidence in the universe that seem to suggest that like, 
it's perfectly tailored towards the supporting of organic life and specifically the, like the supporting of human life, which isn't to say anything of like intelligent design or blah, blah, blah. So I'm not, I'm not bringing that into account. But there seems to be a kind of tendency in nature towards the human person and that the human person is a kind of microcosm. It takes into account all that's lower and brings it to perfection. That's not to say that like animals are just for eating. I mean, they are delicious. You know, Chick-fil-A, mm -hmm. oh gosh. Um, <laughs> but it is to say that like, we should be asking questions of finality because it actually orients our study. Like you can do a ton of good things with force and with stuff, yep. right? But force and stuff doesn't ever answer the question why or to what end. Mm -hmm. And then force and stuff can kind of just become untethered. And as a result of which, your inquiry is just like a matter of what can be done, mm. you know? It seems like we've done away with teleology in the realm of morality as well. Mm. So when the Catholic argues that contraception is intrinsically evil because it frustrates one of the two ends of the sexual act, yeah. if you've done away with the teleology of the sexual act, that doesn't matter. It seems like we've done away with teleology and we're all about autonomy. Yeah. So people still use moral language, but when they say that's immoral, they mean you're hindering somebody's autonomy. And that's yeah. sort of it. So if two people wish to degrade each other, that's okay because they use their autonomy to make that decision. Yeah. No, like, like a lot of it is downstream. Well, you can talk about modern philosophers. Uh, it's kind of uninteresting in certain regards. But like this whole idea of the fact value distinction, just because something is what it is doesn't mean that you can say what it ought to do, therefore. Whereas like the kind of classical pagan and Christian tradition is that what a thing is actually sets the terms for what it ought to do without being like overbearing and paternalistic. It's just to say that like your nature is a principle of unfolding. So we are, as human beings, not made at the end, we're made on the way. And we actually have a kind of blueprint for our progress or for our unfolding um, that's written in to our very nature itself. Um, so like for instance, I don't know, like I have teeth and they have enamel on them uh, and I should probably take care of them because they keep my teeth from rotting out of my face. Uh, so which means that I should treat them in a certain way with like, I don't know, baking soda, Arm & Hammer, blah, blah, blah. And I shouldn't like brush with Drano, right? Because mm -hmm. if I were to brush with Jane, Drano, I'd like die and I'd have like a half mouth like that one villain in one of those James Bond movies that wasn't that good. <laughs> yeah. um, Skyfall. Yeah, it was like Javier Bardem and he like removed his jaws like, whoa. Um, so yeah, like because I am what I am, I ought to do certain things. And people can acknowledge that with respect to like your body. But we are embodied souls or we are in soul bodies. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's another principle here. And it doesn't have to be like a spiritualist claim that there's like a ghost in you and how can you confirm or deny the fact that there's a ghost in you. It's just like, what is a soul in the classic sense? A soul is just what makes a living thing to be alive, right? So it's just, it animates us. The Latin word for soul is anima, right? Yeah. So because we are a living thing, there are further considerations to be taken into account. So if there was you and then 10 minutes later a dead you, yeah. what just changed was the thing we call the soul? Exactly. And because I am living and not moldering in the grave, there are, there are further considerations. So like, how do I, you know, kind of like, like cultivate happiness, just to speak about it in the most kind of basic sense. How can I be free? How can I be happy? How can I be fulfilled? How can I be, how can I, you know, suck the marrow out of life? Um, and you find that like, there are certain things that actually promote your happiness and certain things that derogate from it, that actually undermine it. And people will just deny this, deny very patent things because it seems like it impinges on your autonomy or it impinges on your freedom. When truth be told, like, freedom comes to fullest expression when you're able to choose what's best, what's good, which is We awesome. were talking about this earlier in the, in the breakfast room, that's what we'll call it, mm. about Ireland oh, and yeah. like actively voting for the killing of the unborn. Yeah. Like clearly choosing something that's detrimental to those being killed and to our society. Yeah. No, it's just like... I mean, it's staggering and sorrowful, and I was just there, and just to see like the degree of anger and sadness uh, that has gripped that nation culturally is just whoosh. It's so dispiriting. But like, in a certain sense, while it's surprising because it was such a Catholic culture, it's also not surprising because the natural law can be blotted out of the heart of man, you know. And with a kind of like with a ton of trauma and with a ton of money, uh, you know, joining the European Union and with like a ton of political upheaval. It just apparently things that we thought were fixed and stable and permanent weren't, you know, they were transient. How can natural law be blotted out of the heart of man? What does that mean? So like St. Thomas... What is, what is natural law first? Great. So natural law is our participation, our share in the eternal law. So St. Thomas draws this beautiful picture where he says like God is a kind of artisan. And in creation, 
he speaks his wisdom or sings his wisdom into all things. And that those things have a kind of impress or a kind of, mm, they, they receive that eternal law according to their own nature. So because we are rational animals, we receive the eternal law principally through our intellects and will. So like at those highest powers yeah. where we kind of meet God in the image of God. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a sense as to what is good and a sense as to what is evil. So the most kind of like basic statement of the natural law is to do good and avoid evil. Or we could say like do what accords with your nature mm -hmm. and flee what does not, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we can actually tease out the natural law. That is to say that we can not make like deductions from it, but prudentially when we're ordering our lives, the lives of our family, the lives of the state, the lives of the church, whatever, um, that we can tease out the natural law into concrete expressions. So like for instance, thou shalt not kill. That's something that you go cross-culturally and a lot of people have discovered that. They've come to that recognition. Um, and the ones that haven't, you know, are on the way, please God. Uh, or like, thou shalt not steal. You can see where this is going. Like the Ten Commandments are pretty concrete examples of high order, like examples of, uh, of the natural law. But that it gets into all the nitty gritty of your life. So you can like make human laws about which side of the road you should drive on, right? Whether it be right or left, I know not which is better. Yeah. Being just in Ireland, I was like kind of like struck by the fact that rather than having like 10 inches of car next to me. Well, that's right. I had like four and a half feet of car next to me. And you just have this like wild appendage that keeps hitting things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and people don't wow. even stop when the, when the windows hit each other. You just keep going. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just dust it off. Um, so, yeah, so we can kind of like tease out the natural law into all of the concrete particulars of our lives. But, Saint, like, so like St. Thomas repeats, Aristotle says, as the man is, so he sees. So what we love actually shapes how we um, can like receive the natural law and how we apply the natural law in the world. So if we really, really like chocolate chip cookies, for instance, okay, just like I, the sight of a, choc like a Chick-fil-A chocolate chip cookie, like I get there, they hand it to me, it's got like the little window pane, mm. you know, and it's already, it's fogged because it's fresh That's baked. That's right, there's a bit of, bit of chocolate sticking to the window. Yeah, like a little bit of chocolate smear, yep. right? So like I could see that. Right, and it could be in like well in hand, and then I could see like a kid in the play place who's like teetering on the edge of an eight foot height, and he's wearing a sign that says like I have brittle bones and like a rare genetic condition that means if I fall from eight feet heights I die instantaneously, and like I know that if I reach for this chocolate chip cookie that like I'm gonna let this kid die, and I but but I could just as well go over there, but because like I have corrupt morals because I've become the kind of person that prefers chocolate chip cookies to like kid saving, mm. you know like now I see this reality in a certain way. So the natural law has been blotted out of my heart and I'm like complicit in his death because I just wanted yes. that delicious cookie. Now, when you say it's blotted out, do you mean that in this scenario, you recognize that saving the child is better, but you choose the cookie anyway? Or do you mean that you think the cookie is legitimately better? And this is what Aristotle means by the vicious exactly. man. So there's a difference between being vicious where like, I actually prefer the cookie. Like, who gives a rip about that And this that is kid? really kind of the argument about in abortion and infanticide. Yeah, so like... Right yeah, I mean, you can, you can get people to acknowledge that, like, abortion is taking an innocent human life. Right, but they don't care. But they prefer something else. Yeah. And that's just terrifying. It's and like, terrifying. Like, the Caring Foundation did some studies in the 90s uh, about, like, a lot of the language that was being used in pro-life kind of, like, commercials and promotion, etc. And what they found was, like, most women who make the choice to have an abortion, they recognize that they're killing their child. Mm. But they, they think it's basically a choice of killing their child killing their future or just like killing themselves effectively. Because like to, to have the child adopted means that child can always come back and ruin their lives. Or That's right. like they have to acknowledge the fact that they weren't able to provide for him or her as a good parent. And then it's like the death of their own self-identity. Or it's the death of their job prospects. Or it's the death of a normal future and education or whatever, going to NYU and studying sociology and like being $260,000 of debt at the end of four years and not knowing what you're going to do. Except like knowing something about Emil Durkheim. You know, but like they, they prefer that. They want that even though they acknowledge that there's this other thing and it happens to be a human life. And people will find it interesting too that Aquinas talks about that no one chooses evil for its own sake. Yeah. That whenever we choose something, even if it's evil, we choose it as a perceived good. And that's what's happening when the, when the boyfriend and girlfriend of the husband and wife choose abortion, right? Yeah. Yeah, which is like, I mean, yeah, super dispiriting. But ultimately, like, I think the, the message, and you can feel this too when you go to like the pro-life march and you hear people saying, we love babies, yes we do. We love babies, how about you? It's like, fine. I'm not taking like issue with them, but I think that the, the, in a certain sense, the mother and father have a kind of perverted love for their child, but as they love something else more, what they need to hear is that we love mother and child both, and we're willing to do whatever lies within our power to provide 
for a happy life. You're like, this child will not kill you. It will not kill your future. It will not kill your identity. It will not kill your prospects of enjoying life. And is that how we help unblot the natural law I think from so. the heart of men? Yeah. When someone prefers um, you know, debt-free or getting to go to school or having promiscuous sex without consequences more than, than letting their child live, how do you reverse that? Because we're not, we're not computers. You don't just yeah. insert a syllogism and the person responds with the correct answer, right? Yeah. No, I'm of the mind that like, yeah, argu argument only gets you so far, which coming from a Dominican is a kind of humble admission, <laughs> right? Because if there's one thing on which we pride ourselves, it's that an argument can, can kind of save the day. One of, one of the, Father Thomas Joseph White, uh, who runs the Thomistic Institute in Rome, he gave a talk on whether beauty can save the world. Yeah. And he said, yes, the beauty of a true argument. <laughs> Very good. So, like, yeah, I mean, we're nerds for sure. Yeah. But it's been, it's been my uh, kind of experience that what, what is more likely or what is more effective at changing hearts and winning souls, not in like a conquest sense, but in a genuine sense of love, is friendship, you know? Okay. It's like genuine friendship. Because think of like parallel example. You suffer a loss in your family. It's devastating. A lot of people share with you thoughts and prayers initially. Maybe some people come over. People condole with you. They grieve with you. They come to the wake. They come to the funeral. Your friends are the people who keep coming, like the people who keep showing up, baking you like weird tater tot hot dishes or like strange, you know, like green bean casseroles, like for weeks on end. Because friendship is principally expressed through sh like showing up mm -hmm. because it's a communion in the good, right? And you need to like love the good for someone when they feel incapacitated to do so. And with like recovering people's hearts from having lost uh, like their moorings in the natural law, it means that. It means accompanying them in the classic sense, you know, like loving them unto the good. Because without friends, like who could live? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the sadness, like a lot of the anger is an expression of loneliness, I think. And that's not to like psychoanalyze these people. Everyone's it's got true. their own stuff. Yep. Um, but a lot of it's loneliness, a lot of it's anxiety. A lot of it's just like crippling sadness, which is expressed in a very profound isolation and alienation. But if somebody can break through that and extend a hand and actually love a person unto the end, you know, that, that, that speaks far greater volumes than any argument, though I would love to supply them. <laughs> I, I think uh, you know, Aquinas, when he talks about those four ways in which we can relieve sorrow, one of which is friendship, he talks about how sadness is like a weight that holds us down and that when I can express what I'm going through to you um, and I see you like sorrowing in my sorrow, it shares that weight. Yeah. It, it's, it's so true. There's a sense in which like friends, like friends increase the capaciousness of your own soul. In the, uh, in the Divine Comedy, in the Purgatorio, there's this one point at which a soul is loosed from a lower circle and it comes up to meet souls at a higher circle. And these souls, those on the higher circle observe, behold, one comes who will augment our love. Literally, mm. one, one comes who will grow our love. Mm. Because like with friends, you have, a, you have a greater capacity to actually like enjoy the good. So C.S. Lewis in The Four Loves, he has this awesome <laughs> example about if you have three friends, and say, God forbid, one of them, one, God forbid, one of them dies, right. yeah. you know, he says, you'd think that those two remaining friends would have more of each other to go around, but it's they don't. They on. have less, because that third person was able to coax good things out of those other two that is only present when he's there. You know, so it's like friends really tease the good out. Friends call us to the heights of our, you know, like, powers, our loves, yeah. our pursuits, our aspirations. There seems to be an attack on friendship, maybe not an intentional attack from anyone in particular. Maybe it's a sort of conspiracy from a number of different angles, like technology and things. But do you see that? Do you see a diminishment in, in friendship and our ability to grow friendships? Yeah, I, I'm like worried about our capacity, younger generations' capacity to actually form friendships. Because a lot of, I don't know anything about social media, so I shouldn't spout off like an old priest with like no, an ash to grow. Every, everything bad you could say about social media <laughs> it's probably has to be true. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Okay. So my fear is that social media superficializes connections. Absolutely. And no as a result of which that. it leaves us um, like sated, like sense wise, ah. but it leaves us unsated spiritually. So like, it, you, like you can watch, you can see like a billion pictures, right? And those are often like very delightful and they cause you all kinds of like dopamine and serotonin release. I don't know, like, I don't know how the brain works either, but whatever. Chemicals. I get you, yeah. yeah. Um, but then you actually haven't attended to like real goods. You actually haven't been shoulder to shoulder in pursuit of what's real. You've just been kind of like looking and oogling each other and being slightly jealous and sometimes like impatient mm. with or otherwise frustrated with your friends. Voyeuristic in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, it's kind of got that weird dimension to it. But as a result of which, my fear is that people don't actually know how to connect. They don't actually ha like know how to find common goods 
that cause them both to transcend the limitations of their own personalities and bring them into pursuits which are like arduous, but like character fulfilling. Um, because if we're never tested, you never grow. I think about that often, like when I'm hiking and I'm, I'm like hiking, hiking, hiking. And at a certain point, your haunches kind of get tired. You're like, like 15, 60 miles. And you're like, wow, I want to like die. And drink whiskey. Um, <laughs> but like that, like those last few miles, provided they don't get to death march slog, those are often the most rich because you get the like the, the crispest vistas, you get all of these awesome things that people don't actually see because they're like too far into the impenetrable wilderness. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't have known unless you pushed on. Like you wouldn't actually have known what your human spirit was capable of until there was a good before you that elicited it, that called it forth. And friendship is meant to do that. Like friendship is meant to like call forth what is most noble in man. But we never get to the hard stuff because we're just like completely satisfied with the dumb and passing. Now that's interesting. There's an analogy there, I think, with food. Mm. When you notice that when you eat candy, you can never have enough. It mm. doesn't actually satiate you. Kind of titillates, tantalizes, yeah. but it doesn't satiate. Whereas you can't have like three steaks. <laughs> you're like totally satisfied over one. So kind of what you're saying is social media is just like the candy. Like it yeah. gives us a rush, but it's not actually satisfying that human desire we have for intimacy. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, like, um, well, this is from maybe like his 40 gospel homilies. Gregory the Great says that there's this kind of paradoxical difference between material goods and spiritual goods. He says like with material goods, initially there's like a pretty good payoff, you know? So like they're easy, they're accessible, they're delightful, they're shiny, they're tasty, they're sexy, whatever. But he says they tend to depreciate. So our experience of them tends to be less and less rich. Mm -hmm. you know, like, and people come up with sweet vocab words to describe this. Cloying is one of my favorite. Cloying? Cloying, yeah, like a sweet thing that eventually kind of taxes you. How do you spell that? C-L-O-Y-I-N-G, cloying. I've never heard of that. I can cloying. use it in a sentence. I can give do you it. provenance. No, I won't, okay. okay. Um, spelling be time, baby. <laughs> um, so, but then with spiritual goods, we find them initially forbidding. So like, if you were to say to somebody who hadn't prayed ever, like, do Get a up. holy hour. Yeah. They'd be like, sweet Christmas, I'm going to die. You know, they'd be like, then there for like one minute, they'd say all the rote prayers that they had memorized, and then they'd get out their iPhone instantaneously and like, let's burn this time. Yes. Because to do nothing or to be contemplative is most arduous. It is. But what he says is you find that these have richer and richer payoffs. Yeah. Not to think about the contemplative life as a kind of like need satisfaction mechanism. Right. But like it becomes more and more rich. It becomes more and more fulfilling because these are the actual things in which our life consists. And this is why I meet Dominican sisters and Franciscan priests and Dominican priests who legitimately radiate a joy that I don't see in the world. And presumably many of these people that I'm seeing in the world aren't denying their appetite, aren't denying their sexual appetite. Meanwhile, you have obedience, chastity, and poverty, and I see a joy in you that I don't see in the world, which is really counterintuitive counter to many people. Yeah, there's a sense too, like, like this, freedom is another way to describe that, that movement. Like a, a, a closer and closer adherence to the really good, to the good good. Um, and oftentimes people think about freedom as a kind of like license yeah. or the capacity to choose between Freedom or from among, constraint. Exactly, yeah. The capacity to choose among a variety of different options. So like I could choose to be a Catholic priest. I could choose to be a father of a family. I could choose to be a business executive, an actuary, a mathematician, to deal coke, you know, to like whatever. <laughs> you can just go down the line. I probably yeah. shouldn't give further examples lest they scandalize. But like I have all of these options. But does it actually represent freedom if I am poised kind of equally amongst all of them? No, because we say that those people are most free who are able, who are capacitated, who are enabled to do what's best and most beautiful. So like um, uh, LeBron James. LeBron James is one of my favorite examples of just like athletic prowess. The guy's incredible. You think about LeBron James growing up in Akron, Ohio. He had all kinds of options, right? He could have gone to school. He could have not gone to school. He could have done drugs. He could have not done drugs. He could have developed his athletic abilities. He could have not, right? So at like, at the age of nine, he's got all kinds of options. But then at a certain point, he realizes like, I'm really good at football and I'm really good at basketball. Maybe I should like devote myself to these things, whatever, you know, like practice a little bit more or just like kind of go to sleep 30 minutes earlier. And now all of a sudden he's got fewer options. Like he's not even tempted by the thought of drugs or tempted by the thought of not going to school because you got to go to school to keep eligibility. You got to pass a drug test in order to like retain eligibility. So like all of a sudden his vision is narrowing, hmm. right? So he's only really free to do those things which perfect his craft. But once he has perfected his craft, he is most free to do it excellently. And you look at LeBron James in like the NBA Finals, whatever, like the, the Miami years or 2016 when Cleveland, I mean, 2015, he almost won the NBA championship simul like alone. 
It was incredible because, like, Kevin Love went down, Kyrie Irving went down, and his, like, support players were, like, a handful of jelly beans, a, like, a dirty sock, and, like, I don't even know, like a Mon Shumpert. But he almost won the NBA championship because he is supremely free. It's awesome because, like, that's, like, freedom is to come to, the, like, the greatest expression of the powers that define you. So, like, to actually love and, and adhere to the good, to actually cling to the good with all your might is is what makes us human. And having all of these options is, I mean, it's whatever. It's like, I suppose it's good that I can choose between a spicy chicken deluxe and just like a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. But like, I know what's best. And it doesn't spicy. involve two pickles, okay? <laughs> so get them off my bottom bun. Sweet Lord. Yeah. You know? No, this is the distinction that's been made before, but Fulton Sheen made it. Freedom from and freedom for. And when we hear freedom today, we often just think of freedom from. Yeah. I'm free. Uh, but as he says, you don't ever say to a taxi driver, are you free? And he says, yes. And you say, hooray for freedom. <laughs> like, you're free for something. And yeah. I think this is what prevents many people from making a decision to propose to that girl or to join that religious order. We want to be free. We want to keep all of our options open. But as you say, if we don't end up making a decision, um, well, what? We're not really free for anything. We're just useless. Yeah, Useless yeah. might be too strong a word, but what do you think? Yeah, we're just kind of paralyzed by paralyzed. options rather than uh, empowered by the choice of one. Yeah, what do you say to people who are discerning religious life? Here's the vocation call right now. And uh, yeah, I mean, there is some of that. I'm so glad, I, I think I'm too impulsive to remain discerning forever. Mm. <laughs> That's why I was like, my wife's pretty. She <laughs> likes me and no one has ever liked me. I need to get on this before she changes her mind. And so I proposed and got married at the age of 22, I think, 23. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who really are terrified of making a decision. What do you say to that? I would say, um, first, consult your loves. Because the God who made you is the God who saves you. And he made you a certain way with an eye towards your redemption, you know, your vocation, your destiny. Um, so as he made you, so he saves you. Creation is a kind of indication of redemption. So he's made you a certain way, and he's made you with certain desires, with certain loves. Uh, and now, mind you, some of those are kind of tinged. Well, they're all tinged by sin. So we're, you know, we can be selfish. We can be overly self-involved. We can be kind of distracted or otherwise alienated, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if you're living like a kind of ordinary sacramental life, you're making use of the sacrament of confession often enough, you know, like maybe like once a month, you're receiving Holy Communion in a worthy state. You're praying every day, say for at least like 20 minutes. You're, uh, you've got good friends, okay? You have like a modicum of discipline in your life, like a little bit of mortification. Maybe you like don't eat between meals or maybe you give up caffeinated beverages, whatever, I don't know, it doesn't matter. You're doing something to introduce a kind of rigor and vigor to your Christian observance, right, as a response to God's gift. Then you can actually presume and believe that God is working to rectify your appetites. Mm. He's purifying your desires. He's healing them. He's actually growing them in such a way that they are going to come to fuller and fuller expression. So like if these things are in place, and you're pursuing your passions, what it is that you love, whether it be like stamp collecting or like uh, entomology, you're just like real into bugs, uh, or whatever, you know, like you're actually going to be made more and more known to yourself because Christ and the revelation of the Father makes known man to man himself. And so once you have a sense of what it is that you love, you'll be spontaneously inclined to what you're made for. So I think it's a bad way to approach like vocation, like there aren't enough religious. I am a human body, I will be a religious. Or like, this is an objectively higher state, which it is. Therefore, I want to be objectively higher holiness, you know. Therefore, I will become religious. Those aren't, those aren't like good considerations because God has called you personally, individually. And he's giving you grace for whatever vocation that he has ordained for you, historically, conditionally, personally, now. You know, so like, it's by responding to those graces rather than like the ones we wish he had given or the ones he ought to give in the future in our estimation that we find what it is that we're made for. And if you find that like, you have a desire for devotion, to be like wholly given in a kind of, you know, like religious way, like a cultic way. You know, you like want to make of your life a whole burnt offering. Mm. And if you want to do great things worthy of great honors, the way that like St. Therese said, like, I want to do small things with great love. There was still a kind of grandeur, even in her little sure, way. Sure, sure. And if you want, like your, your relation, if you would describe your relationship with Jesus in spousal terms, you know, and you find that you're kind of inclined in that way, and that's good, too, because, mm. like, w I mean, women have an easy time describing themselves as brides of Christ. Yep. But, like, truth be told, like, male religious, while this sounds kind of strange. No, it's not. They're it's also. Read John of the Cross, yeah. Yeah, they're, I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a similar dimension because, like, priests, I mean, people talk about priests being married to the church, but, like, that's kind of weird and doesn't really work. You're, like, effectively, you're, you're married to the Lord, and yeah. you should experience that in a kind of spousal, Absolutely. exclusive, intimate way. So if those, like, desires are kind of coming together as you pursue your passions, I think that it's, 
is worth checking out. Father Bob Bedard, who was the founder of the Companions of the Cross up in Canada, said, since discernment has become fashionable, no one's made a decision since. <laughs> uh, and I think there's some truth to that too. And so, yeah, I think it's important that you just step out and make a decision. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard. It, it can be hard too because sometimes you feel like you're getting out in front of the Lord, you know? Because oh, a sure. Because like a lot, a lot of vocational discernment is patience, right? Because what is vocation about? It's about being conformed to Christ. Who is Christ? He's the one who suffered, died, was buried, and rose from the dead. So it means like vocational discernment will always entail a little bit of his passion. Like you're going to taste his suffering. You're going to feel the wood of the cross. And, and sometimes that means waiting, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't get ahead. Like you can't get out in front of the decision if it's not actually the Lord prompting, if the grace hasn't been given. Because if you do, it will crush. You know, it really will crush. But if it's in response, you know, if it's really receptive and it's really kind of determined by the Lord's initiation, yeah, then it, then it will be fruitful. But like you just got to be patient. To be mm. patient is to suffer well. It's to suffer with the Lord. I remember when I was discerning religious life and was thinking of the priesthood and was looking into different religious orders, as I said to you, I felt drawn to the Franciscans. But I remember feeling guilty because I was really attracted to the habit. And I thought, <laughs> well, this is a very super superficial thing to be attracted to. And I was embarrassed to sort of say it. Uh, but I remember a, a, a Franciscan who became a bishop who said to me not to be afraid of that. And I'm saying that for those who are watching who sure. might be experiencing the same thing. Because he said the Lord can call us through those uh, seemingly superficial things um, because they are an expression of the charism of the order. But also we are attracted to similarly seeming, uh, seemingly superficial things when we're dating. You know, I like her eyes or I like her hair. Well, obviously, if that was your sole reason for marrying her, that wouldn't be good enough. But it's, it's, it's the beginning of an attraction. And don't be afraid to allow that to lead you deeper. Would you yeah. agree with that? I would agree with that. Yeah, the Lord uses... I mean, like, yeah, there are a variety of things that you could say, but habits, habits are beautiful in a sense, too, because we associate them with, like, public witness. We associate them with, like, gospel radicality. But we also associate them with, like, the cultic. You know, like, people wear strange garments because... People hear cultic and they think right. of a four-letter word now. That's all it's become. What does cultic mean in the Catholic sense? So, like, cultus in the sense of, like, worship. Like, right. dedicated worship. Something that you would associate with, like, a holy place, a shrine. Some place that smells like sacrifice, right. as uh, C.S. Lewis describes it until we have faces. Okay. So, like, you see somebody in a habit and you realize that that person is set apart for holy things, for worship. That is the precise reason for which they have been called for contemplation, not not to like in contemplation to like accumulate grace points so that they themselves can advance. You know, it's because God is worthy to be praised. And that's it. Full stop. Contemplation is an end unto itself. It need not be instrumentalized. It ought not be like instrumentalized. Play. Yeah, exactly. It's got this. It's got a kind of playful freedom to it. And so like when you see somebody who is set apart for worship, that's why we speak about religious as ten dollar word eschatological signs, right? Mm -hmm. So eschatological meaning like end times are associated with the end, the second coming. Because we see in the religious what we will all be doing in the end, which is worshiping the most high God. Not in the sense that we associate it with like bad liturgies, with bad music and bad seating and like uncomfortable pews, but in the sense of like being wholly alive, firing on all cylinders in the presence, the loving vision of the one by whom you are created and for whom you are destined. Like that is what we are meant to see in a religious. Like this is one who is neither married nor given in marriage because in heaven we will all gaze upon the unveiled face of the incarnate Lord, you know, and that's, and that's enough. We don't need signs. We don't need sacraments. We don't need mediation. We will only need him. Um, so yeah, like to, I mean, like you have like a kind of faint sense of that in the habit. Just like even if you can only express it in the sense of like that's different or that's pretty or like cool, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, I would like to talk about God mm. because you believe in him, and uh, in particular, I want to talk about Aquinas's five ways. Great. What are they? Rattle them off. Perfect. <laughs> there are five of them. They're, they're enumerated uh -huh. in Prima Pars Question 2, Article 3. Thank you. I that's shall. right. And it's easy to remember. One, two, three for those at home. One, two, three. Exactly. Yeah, that's a helpful mnemonic. Um, so the first one is from motion. The second one is from efficient causality. The third is from contingency. The fourth is from gradation. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. yeah What's well up, done. dude? Uh, and then the fifth is from teleology or final Finality. causality. Finality. Oh, my gosh. I was hoping for a cheers. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well done. <laughs> now... Many people, because we've just been through this new atheism right. phase, which really seems to be dying out it now. Does. And the Jordan Peterson thing seems to be filling its void. Right. I, it's so interesting to me. 
I think that um, no it, one's interested in listening to Dawkins anymore. Harris seems like a really interesting guy. Yeah, he still has some popularity, but Peterson, with his respect of religion, even if he isn't hasn't affirmed necessarily that he believes in God, though he says he lives like he he does, that seems to have taken its place, and which I think is an interesting phenomenon in its own. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I think the new atheism kind of overplayed its hand. Um, I think they leaned too heavily into like the vitriol, they became uh, so convinced of their arguments uh, that they, I don't know, they, they like gave them with too much gusto and I think it actually turned off there their w- audience. There wasn't enough nuance. Well, well, I think like in a certain sense, like I think a lot of millennials are conflict averse, right? So like a lot of millennials may not necessarily have any affinity for religion. You know, a lot of them identify as nuns, uh, but they don't like intolerance or something that smacks of violence because that's perceived as hmm. like a, a cultural evil. And the new atheism, I think, overplayed its hand in like it, it just made such a caricature of religion or it like lampooned theology in such a way that they, they kind of, it, it just begs credulity. And it's also angry. So it's very hard to follow somebody who's like, uh, you know, like philosophically unfair and also, like, very, very mean. Well, it definitely, I think, appealed to teenage men and, mm. and, and young adult men, right? I think for a time. There's a, there's a sense in which it, it appears masculine at first because it's very abrasive. Like, Christopher Hitchens was a wordsmith. He was yeah. brilliant. He was charming. No, he's a good writer. Um, and he also seemed to, like, state his opinion and I'm not going to worry about your feelings. I'm just going to speak the facts. I think there's something kind of that appeals to the masculine in that. Yeah. What did I read? I read a book recently called Seven Types of Atheism by a guy named John Gray. And um, he kind of does, he's, he basically he's reacting against the new atheism, which he thinks is um, basically it's religious in the sense that it's indebted to certain religious beliefs. So it espouses this notion about like monotheism or uh, it at least grants the terms of religion. It lets religion sets the terms of debate. Whereas he like advocates in the book for other more tolerant types of is atheism. Is he an atheist? I think so. Yeah, he he said he's he's most um, inclined towards the atheism of like a George Santayana, mm-hmm. or like a Joseph Conrad, something like along those lines, where it's like there's a kind of like nobility of the human spirit before the inky blackness of the void of meaning. You know, it's like man's nobility is basically to stand before the absurd and Not to press blink. on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which you know, like you can see uh, evidence of that in like Camus and yeah. the Plague or the Stranger and stuff, but. I mean, I think that like what, what millennials want now is authenticity, sincerity, a kind of coherent form of life. And they see the hatred or violence or, you know, the caricatured nature of some new atheist arguments and they find that unappealing. But I think these, these other types of atheism, I think, are going to have better purchase. A lot of them are philosophical, so they're always going to be the particular province of few. But yeah, those are my thoughts. There are obviously some scary smart atheists. Not, hmm. I, I know you're not saying this, but they're, they're, they're obviously, not, obviously not just the um, kind of philosophically inept types. Like no. Dawkins is evidently philosophically inept. When you look at his summary of the five ways, he literally misunderstands every one of them in a pretty obvious, glaring way. So what's your, what, what do, you, do you think that there's one particular way of Aquinas's that you find the most convincing, or do you think they make a good cumulative case that when you put them all together, they're the most convincing? Both. I know that's so not we, an answer. No, that's all right. Which is which? It is. It was a false dilemma, and you split the horns. Uh, which which is your the most compelling? For me, it's the third way. Yeah, a lot of people say that. Yeah, I don't know why. Just like what, the way I think well, about it, it is that. As well, I want you to explain it to us as well. Because okay. Those at home have no idea what this is. So convince me that God exists. The third way. With pleasure. I'm going to do a little preluding. Go for it. And then interluding. Prelude. And then postluding. <laughs> so, There's going to be a lot of looting. All right. All right cool. Loot away. So yeah. Cheers. Um, so. With the, with the five ways, first thing with which you need to approach is like kind of like the right disposition. So the five ways are not going to like blow you out of your seat. They're not going to make your socks go up and down. They're not going to like burn off one eyebrow, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, what they are going to do, though, is if you continue to return to them, is mm, exercise a kind of like conceptual therapy. So here's the thing. I said that what we're accustomed to, or the lines are, along which we're accustomed to think are these like materialist, reductionist, naturalist lines. From a young age, you know, you're, you see the periodic table of elements and somebody just tells you these are the building blocks of all material things. And you're like, 
Okay. And then you think atomistically, like everyone basically thinks atomistically. Instead of saying, hey, these are like energy slash electrical things that go to constitute what is most basic in your understanding, like your cat, for instance. So instead of starting with like substances, we start with building blocks. So we're always reducing. We're always thinking materialistically. We're always thinking in this kind of new paradigm of science. When you read the five ways, though, it's, it's kind of introducing you into a new or better or older way of thinking, which is to say like a metaphysical understanding of reality. So instead of approaching reality from like what's at the bottom of it or like how do I clear away things that are distracting me, you're asking the question of what is and why. So how did this thing come to be? How does it um, sustain its existence? And how do we account for that philosophically? So there's this like kind of conceptual therapy that has to go on. Mm. Um, one of my confreres, Father Raymond Snyder, he likens this to um, apparently there's a Monty Python sketch about the most hilarious joke ever. Uh, oh, this is where they, they, you never see what it is. They're just showing each other and bursting out laughing. Is and then the dying, yeah. Yeah. Well, like the guy who writes it finds it so hilarious and then dies. And his <laughs> wife comes in the room, she reads That's it, and then right. she dies. And then there's like a bunch of police investigators. They all die. They figure it out. Eventually, they like have it translated into German and then like project it one word at a time across the lines and like kill all the soldiers. <laughs> but, but people like look at the proofs or they hear that there are proofs for the existence of God and they expect them to be like the funniest joke in the world. Like it's going to absolutely devastate Dumb. them. Yeah. 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 Like, and, and they cannot not question. Yeah, so, but, but people will look at them and they'll say, well, that is expressed in a philosophical paradigm that I've never encountered before. Fascinating, but whatever. And then they'll be like, and I didn't believe in God before I encountered it, and I still don't believe in God. So okay. what does that mean? Does that mean that the proofs for the existence of God don't work? Not necessarily. If they don't compel us? Yeah, no, because they're not like, it's not like their efficacy is proved by suasion, you know? It's not like, in order for me to carry my point, I need to convince everyone in the room of it. Now, true things are just true because they correspond to reality, okay? So it's either true or it's not. As to whether or not we can access that, different thing. So when you approach the five ways, you're doing conceptual therapy. You're, you're inhabiting a metaphysical world. You're looking at the world the way that St. Thomas looked at the world. In a certain sense, you're seeing it under the aspect of being. And reality becomes transparent to your gaze, and you see it as so many things issuing from an unmoved mover or a first cause or the necessary being or what is utmostly good and beautiful or what is the final cause of all. So, yeah, with all of the different arguments, basically you start with some observation of what is in reality. Mm -hmm. So, like, in the first way, St. Thomas says, this is the most evident way. This is the argument from motion. And he says that there are things and they are moving. And he says, cheers, let's go from there. Uh, <laughs> which is significant because in modern philosophy, you can't even get people to acknowledge that. Rene Descartes is like, okay, I kind of distrust my sense or, or like my sense knowledge mm -hmm. as a result of which I need to build everything up uh, by a new method. Mm. Um, and in that new method, I need to prove everything from kind of pure postulates of reason. So that's just like, that's, well, whatever. Can so, we just say how fun that would have been to be with Descartes in his dressing gown? Oh, yeah, in his yeah. nightcap. Oh, my gosh, just smoking <laughs> a doobie. And we were like, what, yeah, what the, can't we doubt? Those, yeah. are the, those are the best parts of the Method on Discourse. Or they whatever. are yeah. absolutely the best. Yeah. When he describes his raiment. <laughs> um, yeah, his pale raiment's hem. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, so like, we are, we're looking at the at reality and we are admitting it as such. So we're not doubting our sense experience because St. Thomas wouldn't even like, he would think that was insane. To he just says motion is evident to the senses. Mm. And by but, motion, he doesn't just mean locomotion. No, say. right. So there's locomotion, and then there's change or alteration. So like somebody goes from being, or something goes from being like white to black. Um, and then there's what he calls, you know, growth or diminution. Something goes from being big to small, small to big, or this shaped to that shaped. Something gains weight, kind of like loses its An apple physical rocks, fitness. Or? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then like the, the, the final sense of change is substantial change. Um, but he says that's not like motion in the strict sense, so we'll leave that aside. So basically we're talking about like changing in place, changing in quality, and then changing in size. Um, and so he just says like, okay, things are changing. How do we account for that? And then this is the big thing that he introduces in all of the five ways is the distinction between act and potency. And at first you're like, duh, weird words. <laughs> um, but they need not be weird or intimidating. Uh, because potency, as you might expect from, you know, how we use it in English, is what a thing can be, right? So, like, act is what a thing is. It's the current traits or the current qualities or whatever that it's giving expression to as we encounter it. So you're actually sitting. I'm actually sitting. You're yeah. potentially standing. I'm actually wearing a wristwatch. I'm actually, a you know, like a Caucasian watch. male. 
-hmm. I am actually, et cetera. You know, like, um, how tall am I? 6'4", and I weigh like however many pounds I weighed. Mm -hmm. I don't actually remember. Um, <laughs> different sense of actually. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, good. Right, but I am potentially a number of things. So I am potentially standing. I am potentially not wearing a wristwatch. I am potentially shorter. You you're, know? you're not potentially Native American. I, here's the thing, Like though. Elizabeth Warren. Right, no. So, uh, actually, I am, though. I'm 116th Native American. Are you? My great-great-grandmother. Is that Nancy more Kidd. than Elizabeth Warren? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't adjudicate don't these decisions. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't follow. Um, but I've never done the swab thing, so I, like a lot of people, am probably claiming more. So you're actually more. part Native American? Yeah. All yeah. right, we're getting off. But I'm, but I'm not actually, or I'm not potentially Chinese. Right. Okay, let's settle the terms. Settle the terms. Done. So what you are, actually is the qualities that you're currently giving expression to. What you are potentially are those things you could give expression to, you know, uh, but you're not presently, right? And, and those terms are set by the kind of thing that you are. Right. Right, so like, like you said, um, I am poten like I'm potentially standing, but I am not potentially flying, mm -hmm. right, by my own steam mm -hmm. because of the thing that I am. So um, he says, whenever you have a change, you're moving something from potency to act. So whether it's a change in place, it's potentially over there, and then it's actually over there. Or if it's a change in quality, it's potentially red, and then it's actually red. Or if it's a change in size, it's potentially five feet three, and then it's actually five feet three. Um, and then he says, in order to get from being potentially so to actually so, you need something to bring it there. Actualize it. Something to, yeah, to actualize it. Something to make it to be such. Okay. And then he says that that thing has to already be actually so. Now, it doesn't actually have to be like, for instance, in this location, standing right. or in this location or five feet two, but it has to have the power to bring that about, either like virtually or, yeah, we can go into that, but it's not actually worth the long description. Ed Fazer has a great description of it as an Aquinas book. He's very good. Cheers, Ed, Ed Fazer. Mm -hmm. um, but then he says, let's go back to that thing that has it actually. What made it to be such? Mm -hmm. And then, you see where this is going, long series of causes. But, he says, you can't go all the way back to some first thing. Or all the way up. Or all the way up infinitely. Because then nothing would actually cause the next thing to be in motion if there weren't some first thing causing all of this to obtain. Now I've gone ahead and just described the entire first way. Whoops. Now what happens at this point is almost everybody thinks you're talking about linear causality. Mm -hmm. And they think this is essentially like the Kalam argument that has to do with beginnings. Right. Like you flick the first, there had to be someone to flick the first domino. Yeah. But that isn't what he means. That's not what he means. What he's talking about is, um, so like existential dependence. Yeah. What we're talking about is what causes these things to be. Now. And the, the, th the third boy gets to this like best, I think, in most illustratively, but the idea is basically like what we're talking about is not just like A pushes B, B pushes C, C pushes D, ad infinitum. What we are talking about is sometimes called an essentially subordinated series of causes. Mm -hmm. That is to say that like you have a lamp, all right, and the lamp is suspended by a link, and that link by another link, and that link by another link, etc. So what causes the lamp to hang? Link number one. What causes link number one to hang? Link number two. And then you go back, and eventually you get to the ceiling. And then eventually, what causes the ceiling to stand? The walls. What causes the walls to stand? The foundation. What causes the foundation to stand? And you can just keep going. But eventually, you get to a certain thing beyond which you cannot progress. Okay? You have to get to the point of what causes these things to be and to be causes. And that's ultimately where all of these arguments end up or how they all eventuate. Because, all right, now I'm going to talk about the third way. Yeah. If you want. Just do it. All right, cool. And pretend, pretend we're on an airplane. Yes. And uh, you've got a limited amount of time. Because I think that's, that is, that, that's why uh, we talked about the new atheism earlier. Are you familiar with the work of William Lane Craig at all? He's uh, an evangelical philosopher. I've heard his name. And, and his, I mean, I think the, what's so appealing about the Kalam argument is that it's so easy. Yeah. You know, and this is something, of course, Aquinas disagreed with. Bonaventure thought it was good. I still like it. Um, he knew, I mean, obviously, Thomas knew nothing about the Big Bang cosmology. Sure. So he was just thinking of the philosophical way. But essentially, the Kalam argument is everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, if they accept those two premises or if they think that they're more, ex more plausible than, than false, they are, it is very appealing. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. And what is, what is the universe? Maybe it's 
time, matter, space, energy. So whatever the cause is must have to be beyond those things. Like that just feels like an elevator argument. Sure. And, and a lot more kind of compelling initially than Aquinas' ways, which take a lot of um, explanation when it comes to Aristotelian philosophy and things. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that like rhetorically the Kalam argument might be a good strategy um, because science may get to the point where it proves that the universe Did has not, a beginning. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. it, it might, but like what, like what do we know? Basically like 13.8 billion years ago there was a big bang. Um, and before then, you have a variety of accounts as to how that could have come about. Right. You know, like, as to whether it's like, you know, like the cyclical, bounce theory, or yeah. if it's cyclical, or if it's like the kind of bubble theory, you know, where it's like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But basically, like, I think a lot of people just do the observation based on the second law of ther thermodynamics. Right. Like entropy, like, yeah. this system is hemorrhaging order. So you, you have to go back to like an, a primal source, an ur source of order. Yeah. And that seems to posit that there was a beginning. But science hasn't yet proven that. Yeah. But St. Thomas wants to make a distinction between the beginning of something and the creation of something. So in a sense, Aquinas' ways are impervious to whether or not the Big Bang Theory holds out? Yes. Yeah, so St. Thomas thought that all of his arguments obtain even if the world is eternal. Hmm. Because a lot of pagan philosophers thought that it was, like Aristotle. You right. know? Um, so St. Thomas says, what we're proving here is the fact of creation, or that's the, the kind of vehicle that we're using to get back to a creator. Um, and what that is, is a, a kind of relation of dependence of the created thing on the creator. So there's a beginning, right? So the beginning is the time at which created things come to be, right? Or the time before which there was not time. But the creation is just this relation of dependence. And that's what he's using in all mm. of his arguments. He's showing that, like, these things that we observe in material reality... We can't, we can't give for them a causal explanation unless there is something that is its existence, mm -hmm. unless there is some unmoved mover, unless there is some first cause that is not actualized by anything previous that makes all of this to be coherent and intelligible. So he's, he's operating on that relationship, yeah. less so, he's not relying upon a beginning of time. So you might say that while the Kalam argument, argument is more initially satisfying, yeah. it, it isn't necessarily, as we say, impervious to some of those scientific questions about the origins of the universe. So, what about the third way then? Let's see. Let's see how succinctly this will be your this will be your a good test here. How succinctly you can put it across convincingly. I'm going to give you the, the Heideggerian summary. Why is there something rather than nothing? You want me to answer that? Oh, you could. I don't know. Nice. Well, uh, same time, it seems to think that like we have to account for that. Now, people differ as to whether or not that's a good representation of the third way, but I think it's pretty good for elevator speech. Yeah. Why is, Why is there, there something? something? Who said that this is the, the, most, the greatest philosophical question that can ever be asked? I forgot, but... I don't know. I don't know. Herbert McCabe, who was a Dominican who lived in England for a while, well, he's since passed, but he, he, he liked to come back to this question with regards to the third way. He just thought that it was just like... It's, Some, yeah. I was just going to say, it's a good introduction to metaphysical thinking. It really is. Because most people don't think in those terms. In fact, people have just heard you say that right now on YouTube and don't even see, don't even understand why you would even ask that. They haven't understood the the gravity of it, and yeah. maybe we never could understand it to, to, to the full gravity of it, but yeah, why it, is that an important question? Well, it's because- There like, could be nothing, it, presumably, or there couldn't if God exists. Yeah. No, like, because when you, when you look at contingent things, that, which is everything that we experience except for God, right? when you look at all of them, you have to know, or you have to see, perceive at some level, that it could have been otherwise. This could have been red. Or it could have been not, right? Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't have to, like, take into account, like, well, we're not talking like in terms of moral tragedy, like you could have been hit by a bus on your way here. It's like, okay, that's true enough, but like you could have just not been. Uh, and that's true of everything. Mm. So then why is there something? If everything is a great, may, if every, may not have been. Yeah. Exactly. If everything is might not have been. Why is it? Why, why is it? And you eventually have to get back to a has to have been or simply is. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Say it again. Let's do it again. Let's, let's circle the wagons again here. Mm, okay. So when you look Wrong at analogy, everything created, yeah. you have to recognize that it might not have been. This stuff. Mm, exactly. Doesn't have to be. That doesn't have to be. I could, I could literally pick that up and smash that right now, except mm. that I'd have to clean it up, and my mother would be disappointed in my barbarity. Uh, or I guess barbarism. Yeah. You'd know more than me. No, I don't know. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, everything might not have been. And we see that. We can perceive that. Yeah. And... This TV, I don't mean to keep doing, doing this at a snail's pace, especially because no, I asked you to prove it teasing. so succinctly, but I mean, <laughs> this TV didn't have to exist. This cup didn't have to exist. My parents could have never have met. 
This book didn't have to exist. Yeah. Uh, the stars in the sky as we see them didn't have to exist. No. Yeah, because, because nothing has a sufficient explanation for its own being. Nothing, nothing like, all of these things, when we see them, they don't say, like, I am this, and it is necessary that I be this and that I exist. Because, like, you know, we have some notions as to things that have existed and no longer exist or things that never exist. Like, we know that there were dodo birds, right? I, mm-hmm. I associate them with Australia, but maybe that's a false association. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. Cheers. Um, we also know that, like, unicorns capture the imaginations of seven-year-old girls the world over. Yeah. But that they have never been, unless you count um, narwhals. Yeah. Yeah. Or unless they're unicorns on another planet. I guess that's possible, right? <laughs> Alternate aliens? reality unicorns? Yeah. yeah. Unicorn aliens. Um, or robot unicorns. Okay. So that these things don't exist, right? But when we look at these things, they do. And there's no intrinsic reason as to why that's the case. Like, this is like a unicorn in the sense that it's something conce- like conceivable. Yeah. A Chemex pot, I think yeah, it's called. Yeah, if right? this never existed, you could have conceived it. And someone did conceive it and then Before made it. Before they made it, exactly, yeah. 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 Um, but it need not have. So when you look at this world populated by might not have beens, you have to account for the fact that they are because they themselves do not supply the answer. They are incompetent to supply the answer. And when you follow it back, you get to a has to have been or simply is. And the sense is that Because God, and you get this kind of like down the line in the first part of the Summa, God exhausts all that there is of being, right? God is. And that's to say like, yeah, so like when we talk about God being eternal, right? Um, That's not just to say that like God has infinite duration, like thinking about him in terms of time. Uh, When Boethius describes eternity, he says that it is the whole and simultaneous possession of endless life. Mm. The whole and simultaneous possession of endless life. So God holds all being in his embrace of himself. He exhausts everything that, is, that can truly be said of being. And so all being is a participation in his being without getting like into like pantheism, blah, blah, blah. You get it. Um, so when we look at all of these things, we recognize that they lack. They, they don't have being in that way. They only have it as a kind of product of happenstance. Well, not to say that everything is a chance encounter, but that they only share in or participate being, but they lack it in its entirety. So you have to get back to something, that someone. That's nature. Yeah, mm. that just is, whose very essence is to be. And so Dawkins here says, well, even if I grant that, that's a far, far cry from saying that this being is someone that answers my prayers, mm. cares about the ways in which I have sex and with whom. Uh, and so you haven't even begun to make your case, which of course is rubbish because you have begun to make your case. It's yeah. yeah, and the Sumer, of course, is more than two pages. I wish that Dawkins had have turned the page. You may have seen how Aquinas began to explain the attributes of God. But yeah, but no, it, I mean, it, like, if you can, if you can make the jump from atheism to theism, the jump from theism to Christian theism is a heck of a lot smaller, shorter. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, like, a lot of your work's done. Yeah. Do because, you ever have doubts about God's existence? No. But I don't know that I permit myself like extended periods of time of like nihilistic doubt. Mm. Um, Do you ever wonder that God doesn't exist and you've just, you know, you could be partying and having sex and making money and now <laughs> that's you're right. just if God didn't exist, I would, I would like thing. worship the sun and just like stay unhygienically, you know, like bearded on top of mountains in like the western United States. But he does as a result of which I'm here. Um, no, I think and not to say that, that I, I don't mean to character atheism as if to say if you're an atheist you'll be an immoral person. That's not what yeah, I'm saying, sure. but I mean uh, it's a fair question, and I imagine some priests think of it like, gosh, and even married people could think of it. Look, like, maybe God doesn't exist, and I'm just sort of wasting my life when I'd rather just be kind of hooking up with this woman instead. And gee, I mean, if God doesn't exist, maybe monogamy is not natural after all, and that's why I'm, you know, you can see how people begin to spiral. But yeah, Dostoevsky said something like, well, it's, I think so it's in Blaise K. Like, like if God doesn't exist. Then all things are yeah, permissible. Yeah, yeah. Ivan, I think reference something like that, and it's it's true, isn't it? I think it is true. If God doesn't exist, then all things are, are permissible in in the realm of morality. Yeah, well, I, I think that they wouldn't be. Well, I think that like so, the vision that Saint Thomas paints, well, the vision that you know, like Christ reveals, is that human flourishing, integral human flourishing, is connected with, is connected with our nature. Sure. So like we have a nature on which grace builds, mm-hmm. and it doesn't like scrap nature, right? Actually, there's a sweet translation of the Summa by these friars from the English province, sometimes referred to as the Gilby Summa, and it says this, quote, <laughs> sorry, grace um, does not consign nature to the rubbish heap. Does it say that? Oh, yeah. It's I love awesome. the English. Oh, my gosh. Super <laughs> to the charming. rubbish bin. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we have the kind of nature that is perfected by these kind of things, and, and it's not like grace 
radically changes it what we are. It. it actually heals, it purifies, it elevates, it emboldens, and it brings us to our term where we ordinarily would not have been able to get there. So in a certain sense, I don't think it is true that if God doesn't exist, all things are permissible because we are still the type of beings that we are, right? <laughs> yeah, but we can, uh, we are, but we, mm. when I say permissible, I, I suppose we mean like morally acceptable. Yeah. Like I can still, cho- we, I mean, we all choose to do things that we perceive to be good that end up being harmful. But when we do them, we say they're immoral and you ought not to have done that. But if God doesn't exist, can't I engage in behaviors that are self-destructive? Uh, certainly, you can. I mean, in the sense of like you're free to when we speak of freedom as like license and a variety of options. Yeah, right. Because then, when, and then the, the best people can do is just say, yeah, it's not good for you. I'm like, I don't give a crap what's good for me. Well, it's not good for society. I don't care. Well, they'll hate you. Well, I hate them. Yeah. It's like, well, this is like, the, like what utilitarian struggled with. And this is like what Kant is reacting against. He's yeah. like, wow, it's just like selfishness. It's naturalistic selfishness. Like, bleh. And then he wanted a, a system of rules that would bind in such a way as to perfect the human creature. Um, and he felt like he needed God as an enforcer or a lawgiver. In a certain sense, is like the buck stops here with respect to reward or vindication. So I don't like, okay, when we say that like, if God doesn't exist, all things are permissible. On the one hand, that's true. Because unless, if your life is not goal-oriented, then you can wend your way yeah. wherever you, you darn well your please. Own goal. So like I leave my driveway and I have no place in mind. I can make all turns. That's and right. in a certain sense, like for me, it's just about the driving. So but the it, journey, not the destination. Mm, it's what we hear all the time. Yeah. yeah. Tom Fuller and Kafar. But if I want to actually get somewhere and I recognize the fact that my happiness is bound up in a destination, then I am like constrained in a certain sense as to which turns I can take. Because if I turn right and I take the Boltwash Parkway, while it will be charming to see that little brick wall in the middle of the highway, I know that there are going to be like innumerable nonsensical slowdowns and that's going to like wither my desire for life. Mm-hmm. But that, that's how I get to Philadelphia, you know, like, that's how I get where I'm going. So I'm able to take that in stride. But if I'm, you know, if I'm not going to Philadelphia, if I'm just driving, I'm going to avoid the Baltwash Parkway like the plague. Mm. I'm just going to find open streets for cruising so I can listen to podcasts, you know, because I'm a nerd. Mm. Um, so yeah. So yes. Yeah. Full thought. Well, why don't we talk about the difference between Kant's view of morality and Thomas's? Because it seems like a lot of us have adopted Kant's way of thinking of morality. As opposed, in regards to just, just your duty, yeah. as opposed to that which allows me to flourish. Sure. All right, start with big words. Um, so Kant's is sometimes described as deontological, in the sense that like it's rule-based, mm-hmm. and our perfection is bound up with following the rules or adhering to the rules, irrespective of enjoyment or happiness. He thinks those are kind of selfish considerations. Whereas St. Thomas's vision, mm. um, it's to be distinguished from like utilitarianism, right? I'm not just seeking the maximization of pleasure and the avoidance of pain for the greatest number. But what I am seeking is the good. And that the good is addressed to me as a perfection. Which is to say, I've got, I've got this kind of nature and there are certain kind of things out there that build me up, right? To, like, to start at the basic level like air, oxygen, good, right? Mm-hmm. Like propagation of the species, good in general, not for me, good for you, not for mm-hmm. me. Um, and then you got like Chick-fil-A, yep. right? Which is undoubtedly good. Except when you purchase it on the app and you look and it like, it counts the calories for you. Like, I don't want to no, see that. Why would they do that? That's so silly because you're like, yes, yeah, spicy chicken deluxe, medium fried, two Chick-fil-A sauces, small shake, and a cookie. And then it's like, you, my friend, are about to eat 2,300 <laughs> calories. And you're like, ah! Don't tell me this. Yeah, but what if I have three meals of this today? I have to be like Michael Phelps to burn it off. Swear word, you know? Um, Good thing you've got a habit to cover yeah, it up. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's very sensitive. Um, so, yeah, so like then you got Chick-fil-A. And then you've got like kind of like higher animal, animal pursuits, like you got like foodies and like wine connoisseurs, and you've got like people who are into adventuring and people who are whatever. And then you've got those highest pursuits, um, you know, so like to know what's true and to love what's good. And what we are as people are just like a big open wound of desire ordered towards these things because these things leap out of the otherwise like neutral fabric of existence mm. and they come addressed to us as things for us. Mm. And so, like, we are actually built up by those things, not just in, like, consuming them like rapacious marauders, but, like, in dialoguing with them. When you talk about the true, it's not so much that, like, you know, like, we don't, like, devour the truth. Rather, we're, like, called up into it, right? Um, so, like, St. Thomas's vision is all good-oriented. There are certain things that we as human beings are made for. Mm. And, and, and some of those things we don't even know until the grace of God enlightens us as to their existence, mm. as to their attainability. Like before you're baptized, like you wouldn't know that worship necessarily is, is an integral good. Like St. Thomas says that we have a kind of natural desire for virtue or for religion. Mm. But that after the fall, it's, it's, it takes, I mean like 
it's obscured. So we need grace to heal our minds with respect to some of the goods that we're called to. Um, and so for him, it's all about being in dialogue with what is real because we are built up by what is real and that we can recognize that as our happiness and it registers as such. Maybe not necessarily as like the kind of joy that like people feel while pumping their fists at a Coldplay concert. Um, but it is the kind of happiness where like you sit down with your family at your dinner table and you like hold hands to say a prayer and you're like, I was made for this. You know, like this is why I have come. So yeah. That's the kind of feeling I have when I'm with my mate in my rocking chair on my porch, smoking a pipe and having a drink. Mm. Dog at my feet. Yeah. You know. That you can like pet. Kids playing on the, on the mm. grass below. Yeah, it's kind of like a... Breeze through the trees, like, this is it. This is it. It's as good as it gets. This yeah. is the reason for which I've come. Because yeah. we're made for contemplation. We're made yeah. for the enjoyment of friendship and delightful things that, you know, like, bring us there. I love how you put that. Yeah, they, these, these goods appeal to us, almost mm. like um, uh, propose to us or invite us to be a part of us. And, we, this yeah. is the, and this is what, the concupiscible appetite, the desiring part of our appetite that but moves like the, the will? The whole thing, yeah, so, like... The lower appetites, kind of like the simple desires of like love and desire and joy mm -hmm. and hatred and aversion and sorrow, okay. but also the higher ones too. Like this is what elicits hope. Mm. This is what elicits daring and then fear and despair and anger, et cetera. But also like e we can speak about desire with respect to intellect and will. Yeah, would you actually this? Yeah. yeah. You don't have to edit Sorry. that out. Leave it. It was cool. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was country. Nice. Who's filming us right now? <laughs> Which one? Hey, camera two. Nice. Um, camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. What's that from? I don't know. Wayne's World. Keep oh, going. It's a little before my I time. I think it was the second Wayne's World. Doesn't matter. Continue. Okay. Um, so yeah, th this whole, we've got all of these powers, the powers of our soul, and all of them are addressed to goods. And they work, uh, like, hopefully, please God, when we grow in virtue, they work together. Yeah. So that was like the original way in which we were made is for all of those things to work harmoniously. And then we fell, and now they're all ordered to their independent ends, and we find it very difficult to adjudicate those claims. Because it's like, you know, your lower appetites are like, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A. Yeah. And then your higher appetites are like, save the falling kid, save the falling kid. And you're like, ah, I am torn asunder. Do you want to go get Chick-fil-A after this? I'm uh, yes. serious. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to do that. Yeah, let's get you. everything we shouldn't get. Uh, no, let's just get it like moderately and in the right proportions. No. Nah. Okay. Nah. Um, so, so yeah, but like as grace like heals you and reconstitutes you in you know, conformity to Christ, you, you find that you actually desire in orderly fashion. Yeah. So it becomes easy and prompt and joyful to do what is good and to pursue those things that are for you, addressed to you. Yeah. It's awesome. And do you think that this, because uh, th th this idea that like God is the kill joy, <laughs> this comes from the kind of Kantian view, wouldn't you say? In a certain sense, yeah, because like, well, I don't really know the genealogy of it because I don't know modern well, philosophy because I stink, but we can certainly, yeah. Well, and, and I think it was even, uh, was it Occam who talked, you know, because Aquinas, Aristotle before him says that there is like a natural desire for the good, like yeah. a natural leaning towards the good, whereas I think Occam said that wasn't the case, that evil and good, are, and, we, and it's just the commands of God. Yeah, that make them known. Right. Yeah, because I think his fear was like this kind of selfishness or that eudaimonism, which is like the big word, which means like happiness-oriented yeah. discourse or morality, was somehow, yeah, it was just kind of like baptizing a pagan system, which was sure. effectively selfish and utilitarian. Um, so yeah, he, well, he doesn't even think that things have natures. So if they don't have natures, right. then they don't have a principle of their unfolding. Which is this, is this the, is this the... The beginning of the end of modernity? Nominalism? Is this yeah, the beginning yeah, exactly. of nominalism? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't really know it that well. I'm probably caricaturing it, but that won't stop me from still sounding Good. Yeah, yeah. Party on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if things don't have natures, so I see like this dog, it's whatever, like a Great Dane, and then this dog, it's like a Chihuahua, and I'm like, meh. You know, if I'm anomalous, I don't actually know what unites them, common dog nature. Uh, if I'm an Aristotelian Thomas, I say like, hey, dog. weird looking dog, other weird looking dog, both dogs. I can like use that concept yeah. to engage with reality. Yeah, yeah. For nominalism, you can't. So if things don't have natures that you have access to, then how can we say that they unfold according to a certain pattern? We can't. So then how do we know what's good and what's bad for them? God makes it known. Okay. But then William of Ockham will say things like, God can command you to hate him, and it would be and meritorious. Would be moral, yeah. yeah, exactly. Because it's not rooted in the created world in the strict sense. It's all just God manifesting his will. Yeah, so according to Ockham, the, the euthyphro dilemma would actually work, right? Like the euthyphro dilemma being like, is something good because God commands? Right, yeah. Command is it, it pious because, because it's pleasing to the gods? Or, or is, is it whereas pleasing Aquinas to the gods would because say, it's pious? Well, God is the good. Yeah, yeah. And, and his commandments are a reflection of his nature, maybe. Yeah, 
So for, yeah, for Occam, with he respect to that, say, yeah. it's, it is pious because God so commands. Commands it. And for Thomas, it's not so much that like God is, so I think the fear is if you say things are, or God commands them because they're good, the fear is that there's something before God that kind of sets the terms. Yeah, God has to wake up and look at his yeah, Ten Commandments. Exactly, <laughs> and like be recollected in what's good and then, yeah. you know, like yeah. to punish accordingly. But rather, because yeah. God is the good, St. Thomas refers to him as the common good of the whole universe. That for him, Gosh. this isn't like, an, it's not a divided act. It's in, in knowing himself and in loving himself, all of this goodness issues as so many manifestations of his glory. And so when we like choose the good as the good, it's under the aspect ultimately of this less last end. Mm. And so like St. Thomas will do this awesome thing in the beginning of the first part of the second part where he entertains all of these options for what can be the last end of man. And he's like, is it wealth? Yes. He's like, no dice. Like artificial wealth, he's like, money, you get money for buying Chick-fil-A. No way is it money. He's like, Chick-fil-A, you get Chick-fil-A for building up your bodily life. He's like, can't that's not that. the, yeah, it yeah. can't be that. And then he's like, fame. He's like, fame is passing, you know, glory. It actually, glory is more, in, properly speaking, in the other yeah. person who gives it. You know, it's not really in you. Mm. And it like testifies to something in you, which is ultimately like more important, like virtue. Yes, yeah, so what God. is that thing, yeah. Or like power. Power is poised for doing things, but it itself is not at the end, you know, it's instrumental. And he goes all the way down with like sensate pleasures, which I suppose most people think is the end of life. And then ultimately he gets to God and he says like, this is the only thing that answers to our desire for what is truly true and what is goodly good, because it's the only thing that is universally so. Because our minds are made for what is universally true, not just like one truth. Like I can know like, this is a T-Rex. And you can rest in that for a moment, but yeah. then you push, your intellect pushes out to know more. But I need to know, like I wanna find where the Dilophosaurus is, you know? Or yeah. the Indoraptor, if I've seen the most recent Jurassic Park. What, is it, what does it say? Ecclesiastes, is it? Where it talks about how like, we can't see enough to be satisfied or hear enough to be yeah. satisfied. We're always pressing out to want to know more and more. So our minds have a kind of rapacious appetite. Rapacious. Rapacious. Uh, what's up, baby? Um, so <laughs> so like, we want to know what is tr like universally true, and we want to love in turn, because knowledge and love go together. Um, here's something that I really don't understand. I don't understand how... Like, one of the greatest pleasures in life is having a desire, knowing that desire will be fulfilled, and then having that desire fulfilled. If I was to remain entirely fulfilled in every respect, it seems like there would be a lack there. Mm. Like, I, I mean, I think uh, Augustine says something like this in the Confessions where he talks about, you know, we eat something salty, and then you drink something, and it's like you're continually building up a desire in order to satisfy it. Yeah. But in heaven, apparently, we won't have any desires. We won't have in any unrealized desires. In the sense that desires. they'll all be realized immediately. Doesn't that seem like a lack? Like, I want to, I don't mean to, I, I, wanna, I want it to be a hot day and I want a cold beer. But in heaven, there will be no desire unmet. So I can't do that. And that sounds kind of boring. So if we take... Do you see the point I'm making? I do. Okay. You, like, the sense is that um, in order to be truly satisfied, you need to have the experience of desire. You need to have like... Well, that's a tremendous pleasure in life. There's a tremendous pleasure in satisfying something that was previously unfulfilled. Well done. You summed it up in, in three words, five nice. words. I said 20 <laughs> sentences. Uh, no, it's Here good. Go. Um, so I think that like basically heaven will be like that for the entirety of your life. So you're, the entirety of your life is one big desire and heaven is the realization of that desire that never grows old. So like think about this. In heaven... Please, God, you know, when we get back our bodies in the resurrection, there will still be marks of your earthly existence. It's like why we portray the martyrs with the, you know, the engines of their martyrdom. And it's why Christ came bearing his wounds. Because the resurrection is not a denial of what has gone before. It's a transfiguration of what has gone before. So in heaven, when we have the loving vision of God, please, Lord, right, it will be as the fruit of a life's worth of longing. Right? And that longing will be brought to bear on the object of our heart's love. So like C.S. Lewis says, when you look back at your, so when you die and you look back at your days, you will recognize them. For those who have ended up in hell, you will recognize them as hell on earth. For those who end in heaven, you will recognize them as heaven on earth. So truth be told, we are already living heaven now. We are already living heaven now because grace gives way to glory. There's nothing like specifically different between grace and glory, except that in glory, you can't lose it. Right? You can't it can't diminish, right? There's no fear of instability. So what we are experiencing now is already a foretaste of heaven. And incidentally, tangentially, that's like the whole point of religious life is to orient the Christian gaze towards heaven, right? 
where we will neither be married nor given in marriage, but we will all be wed to the Lord. So I think that the, the satisfaction of heaven will, will retain the dynamism and the history of your going there. Hmm. So like, there's, for the same reason that Jesus is recognized not so much by his face after his resurrection as by his wounds, so too we will be recognized by our desires. Like what impelled us to the vision, what actually drew us hmm. there. So like, in that same book that I mentioned, The Quiet Light, which describes you know, the life of St. Thomas Aquinas, one of his sisters asks him, St. Thomas, like, how, do I, how do I become holy? How do I become a saint? Will. To which he is said to have respond, desire it, right? Because desire is the antecedent to the consequent of enjoyment, right? But it's, it's still present. Desire is just love in motion, and rest, enjoyment, is just love realized. But it's, they both... Give, like, they both give expression to the same phenomenon, which is the recognition of something as addressed to me, as for me, as perfect for me, but that calls me up and into it. So like in heaven, there won't be this kind of like selfish assimilation of the beatific vision where I like parcel it off and like keep it for myself and keep it away from all the other saints for, like, like, for fear of it diminishing. It's the kind of good that we don't so much possess as are possessed by it. And it's a common good, which means that it doesn't like Seems. diminish when it's shared by many, it actually grows. So like we're called up into it and they're like, you can think about like C.S. Lewis's description in The Last Battle, like further up and further in, it is a house that is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. So there are constantly like new vistas, not in the sense that we'll be growing in charity, but that we'll be discovering more and more of God. Yeah, so I think it will retain that dynamism. That's beautiful, beautifully put. That's what I was gonna ask you because um, how, how we love on earth uh, will result in our ability to enjoy God forever and all eternity. Um, and I think it was Teresa of Avila who said, all will be sufficiently full, but some will be kind of a larger vessel than others. So the Blessed Mother will be an ocean, Mother Teresa a swimming pool, I'll be a thimble if that, <laughs> um, and yet we'll all be full. But is this, an also, is this a way to look at it where our vessel, will our vessel be continually growing throughout all eternity so as to receive more or no? Um, I don't think so. In the sense that like, the, the, the degree of charity that you merited in life is the principle of your enjoyment of the beatific vision, and you, can, you cease meriting at the moment of death. So when the body and soul mm. separate, you cease to merit. So that's, what, that's also what gives such dramatic import to this life, because, because there's, like, there's a kind of timelessness, both to purgatory and to heaven. We participate the eternity of God in a far more awesome and peculiar way. So right now, we are living this life of time, you know, it's proper to us as humans to be time bound. Uh, and so everything is filled with purpose, filled with drama, because we are proceeding on the way towards the vision of God. And everything tells for or against that glorious strain. So, no, we won't continue to increase. Interesting. Yeah, but there will still be a dynamism. But how? Dynamism, what does that mean then? There's like still, a, there's a kind of movement in the sense that like, so St. Thomas says that the perfection of charity is present, you know, in the habit, you know, so when you grow in the habit of charity, the virtue, but he says it's most perfectly present in the actual act. So when you are loving, that's where you are most charitable. That's what's, what's like most particularly excellent about the human creature. So we are going to be loving in a fully actualized way. We won't just be capable of knowing God and of loving God. We won't just have developed virtues for knowing and loving God. We will actually be knowing and loving God to the fullest extent which we ourselves are capable of at that juncture. So, like, we'll be firing on all, on all cylinders. You know, we will be, yeah. I, I, in a certain sense, too, like, I love to think about it in terms of our history. You know, we'll, we'll be singing the song of how Christ has saved us. Because, it's a, you know, St. Paul talks often about how we, you know, we fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ or... Um, that we kind of like bring to birth, you know, in labor pains, you know, the grace of God at work within us. So there's a sense in which the redemption is incomplete until it's complete in you or in me. And that's what our earthly lives are for, is for Christ to tell his story in us in a unique and beautiful way. There are certain things about God that only we can tell by our vocations, right? There are certain um, notes in the heavenly choirs that only our voice can supply. And so we will sing of God's glory in a way that we, only we can, or only I can, or you can, and we'll go on telling the story of how the grace of God was at work in our life. And that's awesome. And people will be able to see it because our flesh will give expression to it in perfect fashion. Like when St. John Paul II talks about the nuptial meaning of the body, our, our bodies, our resurrected bodies, will give perfect expression to the love, the desire, the enjoyment of our souls in a way that is concretely you. 
so in that, I think there's still dynamism because it's actualized. It's like, mm. yeah. That's literally the most beautiful explanation of heaven I've ever heard. Dang. Thank you. Dude, Jesus is Lord. Um, let's talk about the intellectual life. Let's do it. There's a great book written by a great Dominican about that very topic. There is indeed. That's excellent. I, you know, I, I'm with you. Let's talk about it. What does that even mean and why should we be bothered? Because right. we're intellectual beings. Mm, nailed it. Um, <laughs> so I think when people hear intellectual life, at first it sounds almost you know, un-American, which for you wouldn't be that big of a deal, but for me it would. Um, really? Un-American? Well, because like, here, hear me out. All right. So when we hear intellectual, I think sometimes we think like, Hoity-toity or elitist or yeah. snooty. Yeah, it's like the kind of people that cold, wear... Cold bag coffee? Yes, yeah, send me. Um, it's the kind of people that wear sweater vests and ascots. Circular glasses. Yes, yes. Glasses like this, maybe. And pocket protectors and like a little... Whatever, I'm not going to you know, challenge people's sense of style. Sure. Um, but we associate it with people who are like locked up in an ivory tower. They don't think about what's real in life. They don't actually have to deal with kids and changing diapers and like carpooling and picking up ladders for like rodent infestations in their attics, right? So like they're the kind of people that just get to like think about things and then they write weird stuff that actually doesn't correspond to reality and then we call them what? Yeah. Intellectualists. What right. a blessing. Um, so I think that we want to get away from that sense of intellectual. What we're talking about here is like a kind of democratic sense of intellectual, a truly American kind of sense of intellectual. Like you can drive a Ford F-150, you can have like a bald eagle patch on your leather jacket. Don't right? tread on the flag hanging out the back. Exactly, yeah. You can like <laughs> like look on like YouTube for like uh, videos of F-35 Joint Strike Fighters and still be this kind of intellectual, okay? It's like waving wheat, purple mountain majesty type of intellectual. So what do we mean? Well, it just means that you think about things, right? So. At first, that sounds kind of, well, uninteresting, but most people don't necessarily think about things um, because we're really busy or we're really distracted or we find it very difficult and then we fall asleep. So what does it mean to think about things? Well, just to think about what's most important. Let's build it up. Let's build it up. So what kind of creatures are we? Well, we're animals, but we're a particular kind of animal, a rational animal. Uh, or as Aristotle called us once, non-feathered bipeds. What's up, bro? <laughs> um, so we're non-feathered bipeds. All right. um, so we share things with the beasts, our desires, our appetites, our sense, knowledge, etc. But then we have these two powers that are distinctive. You know, like we are the only kind of material creation that have minds with which to know and hearts with which to love. So if that's the case, um, then you would think that what we are as human beings is going to be bound up with those powers because yeah. they're really like decisive, really determinative. And so like when you search the Christian tradition, when you talk about being made to the image of God, that's principally associated with knowledge and love, with, with intellect and with will. And will just means like the kind of desire that's born of understanding in a spiritual sense. So we are like the kind of the drama of our life is to, to develop those powers, to grow them. Because we are going to be only as satisfied as we are capacious of being satisfied. And the whole like pursuit of knowledge and of love is a, you know, it's a story of growing our capacity for God. So, yeah, so like Aristotle, for instance, thinks that human perfection is bound up with contemplation. Hmm. Yeah. And sometimes when you hear contemplation, you think like um, a kind of whatever thing that only monks do. Yeah. I don't know exactly how to yeah, describe yeah, yeah. it. But like you, you think contemplation and you, like the first thought is like St. Pio of Pietrelcina. Actually, when I was on the plane this morning, I got into my seat and I was just like in seat B, which is that deadly spot between oh, A and C. Sweet Christmas. And not the pointy end either. You were back in coach and you are very tall. Yeah, 27B, man. That was my jam. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're looking at the seat that's 26 inches in front of you and then like you can already and your feel knees your butt. Your yeah, ears. <laughs> yeah, your butt's already starting to fall asleep. And I look over at the lady next to me. Yeah. And she's listening to an Opus Dei reflection. No, that's yeah, wonderful. I was like, what's up, baby? Did you say hi? And she had like a Did little. Did you call her baby? She, no, I didn't call her baby. Good. Um, she had a little image of St. Pio of Pietrelcina. I was like, boom. Did and you then say she started, hi? I did, yeah. We had a oh, long combo. That's wonderful. And she showed me like a lot of sweet pictures from her most recent um, pilgrimage to Rome and that's to lovely. San Giovanni Rotunda. Okay, so when we think about. Okay, back on track, my bad. Um, when we think about um, blah, blah, blah mysticism, we yeah. associate with like St. Pio or like St. John of the Cross, or like St. Joseph Cupertino, who's like flying around with a bunch what of angels. What is happening? Right. So we're not... That can be unhelpful if we associate contemplation just with great saints. 
Okay, like these 16th and, century Baroque saints who are always like being like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's actually a really good impersonation. Thank of you. Um, I actually learned recently that that mystical encounter that Saint Teresa of Avila had yeah. is called the transverberation. Oh, really? <laughs> that's such an awesome word. Yeah. yeah, she got transverberated. What does that mean? I have no idea. Right. I think it's something to be through Changing verberated. Wording. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's so what, that's actually portrayed that's what in the, the Brazilian. Flash does when he walks through walls. <laughs> Anyway. I shouldn't. I shouldn't joke about holy things. But she was transverberated, mm. um, and that's portrayed in Bernini's statue, which is right outside of the Parthenon. There, yeah, it's okay. Beautiful. So we're like contemplation, transverberation, crazy. I'll just change the diaper. Okay, no. What do we mean by contemplation? We mean thinking about things that are most truly true and most, you know, really real. It means thinking about those things wherein our our life is comes to completion, or or where our life is really bound up. Because if you were to ask somebody like. What's, what's like, what, what are you like about? You know, they're like, well, um, you know, like I like NASCAR and I'm into like botany, you know, I'm like a member of my local Humboldt chapter and I'm casually interested in beekeeping. primates, you know, beekeeping. Yeah, sure. I'm an amateur primatologist, you know, mm-hmm. very interested in bonobos. <laughs> but if you're like, yeah, like what do you like really, like what are you, what are you about? Mm. You know, and then you kind of get to those things like family, you know, and then lamentably some people are just completely bound up with work. You know, but like they recognize if they're just working to work more, you know, if they're taking their recreation just to be fresh for work so that they can work harder and more efficiently, like there's something, bah, you know, and that's why like a lot of millennials have problems with cubicles. So, but you get to this question of like, where do you hang your hat? Where do you rest? Where do you play? Where do you enjoy life? And eventually you're going to have to get to like contemplation. And some people do it with like nature, you know, like, you know, like Yosemite National Park is my cathedral. It's like fine, you know, for sure. Um, If you ever think that. Just consider the fact that it could have been a reservoir because there's a huge valley right next to Yosemite called Hetchy Hetch, and the government had a choice. They're like, we need to back up a lot of water so that people south of here can drink, and they backed up Hetchy Hetch, but they could have backed up Yosemite. Uh So you're like, wow, dude, Alex Honnold free soloing this sweet El Cap thing. You're like, yeah, that could be underwater. What's up? Okay, so yeah, but like people have some sense that it's contemplative. It's about thinking and loving and that we really, yeah, being, really. And, And it's not bound up with what you do. And then if it is, it's always going to be a rat race. So that we should cultivate a sense of thinking about the right things and loving the right things because that's where we are most properly human. That's where we are fully alive. Um, so I think that everyone is called to that kind of intellectual life. You know? And it yeah. means a little bit of reading, but more principally it means praying. You know? I think it was Chesterton who said something like, cows are satisfied in the meadows, men smoke discontentedly in the bars. <laughs> Uh, but that does go to your point that we, since we're rational beings, we actually won't be satisfied living like a beast because yeah. we've been made for more. Yeah. And this is kind of where the intellectual life comes in to satisfy those natural uh, potencies we have and desires. And it involves a little bit of restlessness. Definitely. Um, Gosh, I'm because, right. like, you know, we have that expression, he's as happy as a pig in a poke. It's like... Different in Australia? Continue. Right, yeah. So, so Much like this, more offensive in Australia. Right. Cheers. Um, <laughs> but the idea is like if you're, if you're completely like satisfied, there's, something's gone wrong, right? right. It's, we think about it as almost smug or like overly self-involved. But like we should be like starved to our crazy bones, mm. but like with eyes wildly yes. alive. Yes. Um, I'm going to quote some poetry. I only Let's know like three it. poems. All right, here, here it comes. I love it. George Herbert. You ever heard of George yeah, Herbert? He's one of these Anglican divines. He has this, he has this um, poem called The Pulley. And he describes the scene where God is creating man. And in the first lines, he's just, he's just lavishing on man all of these gifts. You know, so beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. And then it, there's this kind of creative pause. And he says, when almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure rest at the bottom lay. For if I should bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me and rest in nature, not the God of nature. So both should losers be. So let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that at least if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. Glory. You're just like, bah! Oh, so like, the contemplative glory. life is like living out of that restlessness. It's the recognition that I am not yet wholly made, and there is only one person who can make me through and through. And I have to spend my days in repining restlessness, but like trying to recover that Godward Mm. gaze, right? Because that is what I am made for. And I will never be content with anything less. Because like when you go to hang your heart, you know, there's only one thing that can support the weight. 
And if you try to hang it on something that can't, that's, I mean, that's sin. It's, 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 yeah. We're getting dangerously close to the argument from desire. But mm. It's a good argument. <laughs> yeah. I think the happiest I have ever been in my entire life was with my wife, Cameron. Yeah. We weren't having sex, although those are good occasions too. I was with my friend Elisa and her husband Chester. We were in San Diego and we went to this little farmer's market. You know, as cool people in San Diego are wont yeah. to do. Drinking Wearing kale, shakes and things. Barbie Parker glasses. That's right. Yeah. And then we, 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 we drove our car down to the beach as the sun was setting and we were body surfing. Sunset Cliffs, La Jolla? Uh, it wasn't in La Jolla, I forget where it was. Okay. But the sun, as it was coming down, made the sky this lovely mango colour. And I just remember thinking, I have never been this happy, mm. ever, and yet I am very dissatisfied. But I think a lot of uninteresting people would want to preach at me at that point and say, well, why? And I'm like, you don't get it. It's like the, when I've been the happiest, it's always felt like a foretaste of something more, be mm. that in marital love or on the porch with that cool breeze and my children playing. It's, uh, it's not enough. There is this, this, this yearning for John of the Cross, I know not what, mm. isn't it? Yeah. That's what I love. Uh, do you like John of the Cross, his poetry? I, so I haven't read much John of the Cross. I've been told not to read him until I'm 40, oh, until I've had gosh. like sufficient Well, I've made a mistake then, but here's a quote <laughs> since you quoted poetry at me. Here's, uh, here, here's part of his poem. He says, um, like a fevered man who loathes any food he sees and desires I know not what which is so gladly found. Mm. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. As someone who's just had surgery and has been fevered and like, I want, but I don't know what I want because I don't want any of this. I don't want coffee. I don't want chocolate. I don't want to run or anything. Yeah. I don't know what I want. And that's his name for God. I know not what. Huh? Yeah. No, I mean, it's just like, there's a long tradition of people searching and ruling things out and not yet coming to, you know, like the name or the term or not yet giving whatever, like, you know, clear expression to their desire, but even even that searching, you know, and I think you alluded to the fact of Jordan Peterson having such a like a kind of appeal now. People have a sense that he's doing it sincerely, and that people find attractive. Yeah. You know, like could he probably benefit from traditional Christian teaching? You know, like would it help him with discoveries that he himself has not yet made? Probably. You know, but like his mode of proceeding has just a very very potent evangelical effect without saying like it's introducing pe to people to the gospel per se but like it's showing people how to desire you know and to be unsatisfied with half measures or half truths you know uh, and if that means for him like building it up from the foundation you know so be it it's it, I mean it serves a purpose of reorienting you know just like reorienting people's loves can uh, we become satisfied with things we ought not to be satisfied in I mean we talked a bit about blotting out the natural law in the heart of man, yeah. how we can come to love certain things that we ought not to love that aren't good for our nature. Can we actually, I guess we can get to a point where we shut our heart down and, and this reminds me of C.S. Lewis. Um, the problem isn't that you desire too much, but that you desire too little. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I suppose we can, right? Yeah. And, and, and why is that? Is it because we, like you said a moment ago or three hours ago, when it comes to Twitter and real friendships, we allow the superficial to, to, to kind of placate us. Yeah. And I think, I, I think our, our loves can kind of just atrophy if they're not exercised. We're the type of beast that needs exercise, not just bodily, but spiritually. And if we cease, you know, if we cease to run, if we cease to pursue things worthy of our heart's loves, then we'll kind of forget how to do that. How do we know if we're not in that situation right now? How do we know if like we're... Like, how do I know? I mean, maybe I, I've forgotten how to love wildly and to pursue, and, and people who are watching now are like, I, I mean, maybe I'm like that, and to some degree we're, we're all like that. Yeah. So one thing I would say is that um, oftentimes it's hard to know in the moment whether you're loving more recklessly now or less so. But sometimes we have these kind of graced moments of clarity where it's, it's, it's shown to us how the Lord is at work in our life. So like a, a, an example that I find very compelling and one that I've experienced on a few occasions is when you go back someplace where you haven't been in a while and you smell something and then like in that kind of totally. deja smelt moment, you're returned bodily to a former time. And not only are you returned mm. to that time and place, but you're also like returned to your sensibilities. Like you have a memory, like a refreshed memory of what you were thinking and what you were feeling. Your and emotional how you, state. Exactly, yeah. And it's weird. It can be like really powerful. Very much so. And oftentimes in those moments, you recognize like how you compare to your former self. Like are you more at peace? Are you more content? 
or like, are you more anxious? Are you more sad? Are you more lonely? I don't know. But like, oftentimes you'll recognize the trajectory of your life only as a subsequent thing because you can't really tell where the line is headed from a point. But when you have a segment, you know, you can extrapolate. So I think that like, you, you know, like you can kind of take your own spiritual temperature, but our own psychological states can sometimes be deceptive. What we want is something more real. We want like a sense of fit, of like resonance. Like, am I living? Am I actually engaging in life? And to gauge that, I mean, it takes, yeah, it takes a kind of manifestation, a kind of revelation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like we shouldn't be able to, but we shouldn't expect to love to the utmost like from the outset, you know, that, that too is something that we grow in. So like St. Thomas talks about how the Blessed Mother continues to increase in grace throughout the course of her life. And there's this 20th century Dominican, uh, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, who Bright talks enough. about, he likens her to like a comet and whatever, blah, 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 terminal velocity. But like she is a comet hurtling towards earth that continues to increase in mm. velocity with every passing moment. So like, it's not that like, okay, Weird math stuff. I studied math. You know, like you got logarithmic curves that go up. No idea. Continue. Yeah, whatever. And then they kind of flatline. And then you got like more exponential curves that go like this. Um, so we shouldn't like content ourselves with like an initial burst of increasing grace and then expect to like plateau for the rest of our days. We want to just be hurtling into the heart of God, huh. right? So we should increase like daily in desire. We're not going to be able to gauge that psychologically, but we will come to find like down the road that I enjoy praying more. I find it easier mm. to spend an uninterrupted 20 minutes in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. Mm. I no longer find, I'm no longer as scandalized by bad preaching, right? I can derive spiritual fruit from it even, you know, like against the preacher's best intentions. Whatever, <laughs> like, like you find that like God is blessing you and there's no other way to account for it except that his grace is operative in your life. Um, so yeah, like desire itself is given to us. Give from us that desire, Lord. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is you read some of the Eastern Church Fathers and sometimes it sounds like they speak about desire as if it were a disease that was contracted after the fall. And of course, Thomas wouldn't say that. And I don't even know if necessarily some of these Eastern Fathers mean that. Maybe they just mean inordinate desire uh, because of course we ought to desire God and that can't be a disease, but yeah. St. Catherine of Siena says, God asks of you not a perfect work, but infinite desire. Mm. Yeah. And this is what, I, I love what Aquinas has to say on prayer in the Summa, you know, can we pray at all times? And he says, in, in one sense, he's very practical, no, of course you can't. Yeah. You know, you've got to pick up people from school and you've got to go to the shops and you've got to pray Holy Mass. Uh, but in another sense, you can, and he says it's through desire. Yeah. Through increasingly desiring. That's why I love the Jesus prayer. Yeah. Because it's like just this continual um, saying of my heart's longing, you know. Mm -hmm. I love Ralph Martin's, the title of his book, The Fulfillment of All Desire, hey? Yeah. All right, let's take some questions from some of our amazing patrons. <laughs> <laughs> now, you haven't seen these questions. I haven't. Um, look at them. Oh, there's not that many. Hoss Hammond says, ask and you shall receive. That's because I said, give me some questions. Could you ask Father, why is it that God loves some people more than others? And it what, in, in what way does he love them? For his love is equal, for we all exist. But it would seem he gives more grace to say like our blessed mother than someone else. Mm. And that is indeed true, Thomas says. Aquinas, is it, you know, you read that in the Summa, whether God loves people more than others, and you expect him to be... <laughs> to be like a good American and like, say, he no, loves them all. He loves you equally. Yeah, exactly. But Aquinas is like, totes. So <laughs> why, why, what does it mean to say that God loves some more than others? That seems unfair. So for listeners at home, if you want to read this, I love this article. It's in the first part of the Summa, question 20, article 3, Devastation Station, okay? So just prepare to have your mind blown or your face melted or whatever, like, rock analogy you want to employ. Um, so <laughs> First part? First part, question 20, I think article 3. I could right. be wrong, but I think that's it. Um, so what does St. Thomas say? Well, he says in God, so God's simple, right? So God isn't making, like, different discrete acts with respect to us. God is loving himself. And we are so many expressions of God's love, okay? Okay. So in that sense, God loves all the same because we are all so many expressions of God's love. Look at you. You got it right. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. Um, but he says God wills some greater graces than others. That is okay? what he says. Boom. <laughs> um, so we have, to, we have to say why, to what end, for what purpose? So here, St. Thomas brings it back to the fact of creation. What is creation for? It's not so that we will all be equal under the law, in the sight of God. It's for the manifestation of the glory of God, right? God didn't need to create. He didn't, right? He didn't like need man. We don't serve a purpose in the triune life that the other persons don't supply for, right? So 
we are a kind of overflow of God's love. We are God telling the secret of his love in time and space. Mm -hmm. And so it stands to reason then that our end, our goal is to return to God and to give glory to him in a way that only we can or each kind of unique thing can. So it would stand to reason too that, that variety is part of God's designs because God is simple, we said. So you can't, God can't speak his divine life in one created word. There's no one word that sums him up. He is inexhaustible. So he speaks many different words so that by all of these wending ways, we could come to know more and more of his overabounding divine life. And so he makes some to be mothers and fathers, some to be consecrated religious, some to be priests, etc., so that you can see in these different dimensions, in the multifaceted ecclesial body, what it means to be the body of Christ, what it means to be God's own. And um, so to some, he gives greater grace because it shows his glory in a way unique to that creature. Mm. So like, for instance, start from the top. Jesus Christ is incarnate. So he took to himself a human nature. That grace we call the hypostatic union. Not important to remember at this juncture, but just know that it's a grace. Greatest grace imaginable. St. Thomas says an infinite grace, a quasi-infinite grace. So there's no greater grace than that. And that's not something that like we get like jealous over. <laughs> like, well, why didn't he become incarnate? And, no, that's just like an insane question. Yeah. So no one like begrudges that to the only begotten son of God. Ratchet it down. Blessed Virgin Mary, right? She's the mother of God. So her life is most closely associated with that of her son. So to be the mother of God is a graced thing. Not only does it require grace for her mission, but it, it's a kind of icon of grace. So we should see what it looks like to draw close to the incarnate Lord, and we see that in the Virgin Mary. So she is given next greatest degree of grace. Um, and that's why we afford her a veneration higher than all the saints, mm. sometimes referred to as hyperdulia. What's up? <laughs> Next, St. Joseph. Think about this, all right? Universal protector of Holy Church, most chaste spouse of the Virgin, foster father the of the Incarnate of Lord, terror of demons. My Party favorite. Yeah. yeah, you better believe it. Um, I was just praying that novena in anticipation of the feast. Cool. Fist pump. So St. Joseph, also given an incredible degree of grace to equip him for his ministry, but also to show what it means to be in the God's family in a concrete way so as to kindle our desires for those things. Um, so yeah, and then you just go down the line. Think about the different saints. So like the good news is that God is giving you grace. He is giving you as much grace as he wants in a certain sense. So how does this change our thinking about uh, the life of sanctification? Well, if you don't become the Blessed Mother, it's not because you're a failure. It's because God hasn't given you the grace to be the Blessed Mother. Mm. He's giving you the grace to be Saint you, whatever, Saint Matt Fred or Saint Father Gregory Pine, whatever. Um, but we are responsible for consenting to and cooperating with the graces that are actually given. Not like, um, like laboring under some nostalgia for the graces that could have been given or like lusting after future graces that might, might not be given. We are to respond to the graces that are actually given because in so doing, we say something of God that only we can. We show his variety. We show all of his divine attributes in a way particular to this vocation, to this time and place, to this setting in life. Um, so yeah, God does it because it makes his glory known, right? And because the purpose of, you know, this life isn't to be equal, all to be the blessed mother, a kind of monochromatic grace portraiture. It's could, to be saints. Could we read his respondio here in light of what you've just said? And then maybe you might want to comment on it. So Aquinas says, since to love a thing is to will it good in a twofold way, anything may be loved more or less. In one way, on the part of the act of the will itself, which is more or less intense in this way, God does not love some things more than others because he loves all things by an act of the will that is one simple and always the same. That's an important distinction because I think the reason maybe that, you know, sounds weird in people's ears is they think, you know, God loves you, but he, whatever about me, that yeah. kind of thing. No, yeah. So that's, that's an important distinction. Yep. In another way, on the part of the good itself that a person wills for the beloved, in this way we are said to love that one more than another, for whom we will a greater good, though our will is not more intense. In this way we must needs say that God loves some things more than others, for since God's love is the cause of goodness in things, as has been said, no one thing would be better than another. Very good. Go. But things are better than another, clearly. The Blessed Mother versus me. Um, if God did not will greater goods for one than another. Yeah. That's great. It is great. Well done, Thomas. Hey, cheers. The guys are real, real well water. Good question. Talking. Joshua <laughs> says, what is a succinct way of saying the Dominican view of the relation between free will? <laughs> 
and divine providence. Nice. Simple way. Simple. Good luck with that. So Free God, will and divine providence. God acts innermostly, okay? He is more interior to me than I am to myself. That's our first principle. Second, the will is a spiritual power, so it cannot be coerced or it cannot be forced by outside things, right? And it's free in as much as it gives expression to this kind of spiritual spontaneity. So we would say that in acting, man and God cooperate or man cooperates with God. So God creates the will, he sustains it in being, he gives rise to our agency, and he moves our will towards the good, and that we, in consenting to and cooperating with that, act in a way that's personal and wholly ours. So that action is holy God's and holy man's. So oftentimes Dominicans would, would argue against this other position called Molinism, mm. and the idea there is that like whatever God does takes away from what I do, so God and man are like similar types of causes, and they're in a kind of competition. So he says that they're like men pulling at oars. So whatever God does takes away from the labor that I need do. And whatever I do, it's in a certain sense, like takes away from what God need do. But the way that St. Thomas describes it is that God is at work in and through the person, giving rise to that faculty, to that spiritual disposition, inclining it towards the good, actualizing it, you know, by his help, and that man is fully engaged in that act. So it's something that's interior, so mm -hmm. nonviolent, non-coerced. It's something that's wholly human, something that we ourselves do, but it's also something, you know, given by God. And that does not entail a contradiction. So we often think the contradiction is either we have free will or we are being acted upon from without. Mm -hmm. And you're saying there's a third option and that is... Yeah, that God, God can move acting. us sweetly and strongly because he's the very giver of the faculty and he moves it, inclines it, and actually kind of conducts it towards its end. And God wills that like necessary things happen necessarily and contingent things, that is to say free things, happen freely. So sometimes people say like, well, if God knows the end game, aren't we just bound to do what it is that we're to do? No, because God has afforded us a share in his providence. It's like it wasn't sufficient for him to make us passive recipients. He also wants us to be agents, secondary causes, like instruments of the unfolding of his divine plan. And so he affords us this capacity and operates in and through us as we you know, develop it um, so that it's wholly ours, wholly free, and yet wholly God's. Hmm. Excellent. Great answer. Thanks. Katie Kutcher says, does he, that would be Father Blaine, have any advice on how a young mother can teach her children how to think properly to use these tools of faith and reason? First of all, I didn't handpick these questions. This is just how awesome my patrons are. That's sweet, They're just man. really intelligent and in-tune people. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, so yeah, I have sisters and they have children and I think about this when I visit them. Um, best thing is, so a lot of the stuff that your children are going to be given depending on their schooling, is materialistic or reductionistic or scientistic or naturalistic. So they're going to imbibe those things unless you anticipate it, get out ahead of it. Um, so I know that, for instance, there's a kind of project in the works right now to write textbooks for science classes. It's this, like, there's a John Templeton grant for this thing called Thomistic Evolution, and then they've got this kind of side project. And I don't actually know how it's developing at this stage, but that there are plans to, to kind of get out ahead of this. But, um, you know, your children will be almost automatically influenced by the modernity in which they live. We're all products of our time to a certain extent. But um, by anticipating that and equipping your kids for it, you can help them to process their experience more fruitfully. Um, that is to say, they, they, they get their first introduction in the home, and those introductions mean something, and they stick, and they're super formative. Um, so that way your kid can go into school, and they'll hear something, and they'll recognize it by the kind of sense of the faith that they've imbibed, you know, at the hearth. And they'll, they'll have the equipment to say, that doesn't sound right. I'm going to go and consult my parents, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, concrete advice. I, I stink at concrete things. I stink at practical things. Um, how to properly use the tools of faith and reason. I think em just like emphasizing the fact that we need never fear the truth. That's one thing you can impart to your kids at a young age is that wherever the truth is found, it's addressed to us for our knowing. So it's not that like... Faith is against reason or reason is against faith, but rather that we have access to reality, some of which we have access to naturally, some of which we have access to supernaturally, and that in both of those dimensions, we're really being faithful to you know, our call to know and to love. 
So if something comes from science and it sounds like it's in conflict with faith, we needn't fear because we believe that God speaks truly, else there's nothing true. So either we don't understand the faith well, or this is an untested hypothesis, but we need to do the work of finding out how they're symphonic uh, because that work can be done. Now, with other faith traditions, that not, that's not necessarily the case. So you can't have that kind of confidence. But you can teach your kids that they have nothing to fear. There's, not, there's like no knowledge that they need shun, unless it's like idle curiositas. You know, it's just like, if it's just like knowledge thrill-seeking, maybe it's not worth our time. But whenever these things come up, we can find a way through and we can actually have our minds conform to what is because they're made for that. Mm. How, how, how important is the reading of good literature in the home to help our children learn to love the good and think well? I think it's very important. So especially like before the age of whatever, 20, it, it, there's, I don't think there's, there's much sense in like reading philosophy or like theology. Not because those things aren't good, but because, you know, just at, when you're young, you don't have the capacity to appreciate them. And I say this to myself, like I was introduced to some things just too early and I developed a distaste for them because I wasn't equipped to actually, um, yeah, to like handle it. Um, so I would say, yeah, to introduce age-appropriate literature is the best introduction to philosophy and theology because what does literature do? It spins out the human condition. It gives you access to a wider human experience, and then it, like, represents your humanity to you. So, you know, prudence is something that's, you know, it, it hinges on having a memory of the past. It hinges on being docile to your, you know, the good counsel of your forebears. But it means you need, you need to have experienced life in order to be prudent, in order to find a way through all of these different clamorous goods and so, you, you know, if like you grew up in a suburb north of Atlanta, you might not have a wide experience of like Yankees, for instance. But you can read those kind of things in literature and have a, a broader understanding of what it means to be a human being, which deepens your appreciation of the real and sets you up for a more fruitful engagement later on in life. So like when I read like Russian literature, for instance, oh. on the one hand, I'm like, this is awesome. On the other hand, I'm like, do I share the same humanity of these people? You know, because it's like... These people are like raving at like 11 p.m. And What's then your favorite uh, Russian novel? Because I love, I just read Tegenev's uh, Fathers and Sons. Nice. Crime think, and Punishment's my favorite. Crime and Punishment, I think. That's the one that makes most sense to me in the sense of like, the redemption narrative is the least ambiguous. It's so beautiful. It is. Well, yeah. It's crazy, speaking about this faith and reason, you notice with um, Raskolnikov that he, he does awful things when he thinks. You notice this? Yeah. So he acts spontaneously from the good of his heart, like that girl he, who he could tell was about to be ravaged or he leaves money uh, for, the, for the, the husband who'd been run over by the horse. And then he walks down the stairs and thinks, why the bloody hell did I do that? Yeah. Yeah, that there's a kind of spontaneous inclination. Yeah. Which is what the name Raskolnikov means, actually. It's a split, like a schism. That's where the word comes from. Wow. Anyway, I love that. What's your favorite book? Um, so, The Gospel of John. That's not just okay. an unintended I meant Russian way. literature, but that's oh, okay. Oh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Crime and, I've, I haven't read many. I've yeah. read... That and The Idiot and The Brothers K. I'm just getting into The Idiot. Nice. Um, my understanding is that it was written after Crime and Punishment and it was meant to be kind of like a mirror image of Raskolnikov. Oh. So if Raskolnikov is the deep, dark, brooding, awful one, The Idiot is the, is, a, is the, the most one. like Christ that a man could be. Which is heartbreaking because he seems like the most naive. Yeah. But his oh. innocence is a kind of like foil for everyone else's corruption. That's true also of Alyosha, I think, in The Brothers K. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you like The Brothers K more than Crime and Punishment? Just because I didn't understand it. Oh. Yeah. I mean, like... You, you must have read it a long time ago. I read it yesterday. not that long ago. <laughs> I read it like eight years ago. The, the reason I like Crime and Punishment more than The Brothers K... Sorry to go off on this. No, let's do but it. But I don't care because I love, I love the Russian authors. Is because uh, I, I love The Brothers Karamazov. It is absolutely glorious and led me to tears on many times. But there's so many side stories... Uh, and things that you feel like this could have been removed from the novel, uh, and the novel would have been poorer, but it would have been no less sort of... Narratively compelling? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have you a know, good, like, anyway. theory or philosophy as to how best to weave a narrative, but... And then what about Tolstoy? You read much Tolstoy? None. I, I have, but he's... I love him. He's brilliant. He's got a really great little book called The Death of Ivan Ilyich, okay. which is all about the life of a, of a civil servant who wasted his life kind of running after honours and money, and then he dies, and as he, it's a slow death, and his family just think he's a pain in the ass. He's complaining about his pain, and they're like, just shut the... <laughs> and so he's just slowly dying, and no one seems to care, except one of his servants who shows love to him, and at the last moment, he realizes there's still time to live a good life, mm. and he chooses to love. It is a beautiful meditation on death, and it's, you could read it in a couple of hours. Okay. Death of Ivan Ilyich, go and read it. Boom, you have compelled me. I'm drawn. Chekhov? 
Uh, what have I'm I read? sorry, I'm going to stop this. But Chekhov's great. What does he write there? About Dead the f- Souls. I read some of Dead Souls and then some short stories. Yeah, the one about the fiddle. What's that one? Uh, uh, I don't know. Anyway, my retention for this is. But we should read literature to our kids. Yeah, absolutely. I'm reading Lord of the Rings to my kids right now, and they Boom. love it. I just listened to a lecture on Tolkien. Did you? On the TI podcast. Tell them. Yeah, there's a podcast for the Tomisk Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Red light, go. Um, there, <laughs> there's a there's a podcast. It's uh, for the Tomisk Institute. I work for the Tomisk Institute, and. Um, we have these lectures on different college campuses, and then we record them and then just put them on a podcast. They're so the, audi- the, tar- the target audience is an undergraduate, and the idea is to engage with like philosophy, theology, literature, art, music, like all these kinds of things in a way that's yeah, awesome. So the, the I should say the audience is an intelligent undergraduate. Can we say that? Because uh, often yes. I'm listening, being like, "Yeah, I totally get this. <laughs> this is super simple." Uh, yeah, I mean, some people pitch it higher, some people pitch That's it lower, right. and it, then sometimes we have excellent. conferences which are like for academic types, and you're like, you're listening to like sweet talk about Tolkien, sweet talk about uh, I don't know, like some visual artist and theology, and then you hear like five straight lectures about faith and science that are pitched at a pretty high level. You're like, "Wow, this is intense." So yeah, different registers. Now I just want to get this. I want people to be able to check this out. Yeah, Rothschild's fiddle. That's a story you could read in an hour, and it is glorious. Anyway, by Chekhov. Uh, all right, let's go to another question here. Trey Weaver says, I'm a youth minister. We recently had a Dominican visit our parish. I reached out to my youth group to see if there are any questions. All right, and here are the questions. <laughs> Friar mentioned that, I don't know who Friar is. Friar mentioned that in the day of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Dominicans were sent to prestigious universities to study. Is that still the case today? And if so, how do they counteract the secular anti-religious nature of many of these current universities? So that is true. Um, St. Dominic founded the order in 1217, and in August, excuse me, 1216, and in August of 1217, he sent the men on the Feast of the Assumption uh, in this kind of act of uh, abandonment to divine providence because he knew that there was going to be a kind of like gravity uh, or a, a temptation to stay in the monastery and live what is effectively a monastic life but he wanted them in the city center mm. so he sent men to Spain he sent men to Paris eventually they end up in like Bologna and Naples and Oxford the big university centers of the day and the idea was that you would take the monastic life and you would bring it as close to city center as possible without losing your soul <laughs> So the idea was that he recognized in the monastic life this particular genius, namely the genius of contemplation, that um, there was something noble and beautiful and, and worthy to contemplate. But he said, well, St. Thomas says that it's better to illumine than merely to shine. And so the, the kind of Dominican genius is that you bring these monasteries close to city center mm-hmm. so that they can be sources of wisdom, so that they can be sources of a holy preaching, which is how their, the Dominican's convents were first called in the early days. Um, and so that people would be attracted by that and kind of called into communion with, yeah, with the Lord. Um, so like a, a thing that's often quoted from St. Thomas Aquinas as like a motto of the Dominican order is to contemplate and to share with others things contemplated or God contemplated. So the Dominican was meant to be just really engrossed in this contemplation of the Lord. And then when he preached, you should see like a man transfigured. You should look and hear and think, I can love God because it's evident that God is loving in this man. Um, And so the idea was to go where the people are so that they could see that as a witness to hope um, and that it was possible to enjoy communion with the Most High. Um, So yes, the Dominicans are still sent to major universities. Uh, That's kind of our our principal apostolate is to preach and to teach at the heart of, you know, the contemporary culture. And it's still possible to lose your soul. You know, um, there's, a, there's a kind of temptation to the active life because there's so much need. You're compassed about on every side by just, you know, the church suffering. Um, and you want to attend to all of that. But ultimately, if you don't have the rooting or anchoring in a contemplative life, then you cease to be distinctively Dominican. And then just like in, in academia, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's its own kind of culture, which is counter to the, the culture of the gospel in many instances. And when you live in a certain environment, it's going to, it's going to affect you unless you have a really, really mm. strong backbone or like a really, really good community. So yeah, it's, it's risky, but I mean, it's perilous, but life is often defined by taking perilous risks. Mm. Garen Gray says, I'm a convert discerning becoming a Dominican brother. You're Cheers. welcome. <laughs> uh, what advice or words do you have to say to those who are trying to figure out if they're called to Dominican life? What's your daily life like? Mm. I'll answer two, then one. Daily life. You wake up, get ready for the day, and then 5:30. you... 5.30? Yeah, so I get up at 5.15, 5:15. shower, shave, etc. 
eat breakfast, and then usually pray for about an hour before morning prayer and then mass. And then about 8 o'clock, it depends on where you are and what you do, you start either prepping your homilies, doing work for your kind of like faith formation in the evenings, maybe you have some time dedicated to study. So most Dominicans set aside at least 30 minutes a day, even after ordination, to read theology. You know, that's in addition to like the stuff that you have to read for making preparation for marriages or baptisms or blah, blah, blah. So you have a, a period of study. And then, um, and then midday you'd have like rosary and midday prayer, you'd eat lunch with the brothers. Uh, then the afternoon, you know, you have another period of work and then office of readings and vespers and dinner, the, the day ends with Compline. My schedule is largely determined by my travels. So Dominicans classically are itinerants, so they travel around, they preach and they teach. And so you're trying to interiorize this monastic dimension so that wherever you are, you know, in whatever city you're visiting, whatever convent or rectory or priory you're staying in, you have the, the form of life is impressed upon you in such a way that you bring the monastic dimension with you to the extent it's possible. So yeah, there's this commitment to contemplative prayer, to a common life with the brothers, you know, expressed in recreation, in common prayer, etc., um, of study, of preaching, and the vowed life. And all of those come together in this monastic context where there's habit and cloister and penance and silence, all of which defend or like kind of delimit your, your consecration. So that way you have a place in which to encounter God consistently. Um, and then, yeah, that's like the daily life is like you wake up, you pray, you work, you pray, you work, you pray. Sometimes you recreate, enjoy, blah, blah, blah. And then you pray and then you like deposit your corpse into your bed and hope that you be resurrected again the next day. I know what a lot of people appreciate when they're discerning priesthood about religious life is that they want to live with a community of brothers. They yeah. don't want to live an isolated life in a rectory away from other priests. Uh, is that something that appealed to you? And Hugely. Yeah, and I, I, I suppose it's something that I'm, com I'm just constantly impressed by. There's a tradition in religious life of fraternal correction. So a way that you express your charity for the brothers is to call them on to holiness. To say, like, you're doing this. I, I imagine it's for this reason, but it seems like it's not good for you for this reason. So, mm. you know, take that into consideration. You try to do it gently and honestly. But the thing that I'm most chastened by, the thing that I'm most rebuked by, or even just like encouraged by, is the witness of the brothers. Mm. So when I see like Father Thomas Joseph White's generosity, you know, and his diligence, I find that really impressive. When I see like Father Dominic Legg's like priestly care, you know, he's a priest's priest, he's an excellent man. I am encouraged by that and called on by that. When I see like Father Aquinas' leadership, you know, when I see Father Michael's, you know, like talent in music, and like, especially with like my closest friends, when I see the fact of their, their consecration and how that actually plays out in the concrete, and you can see it in all of these different settings. And what is most impressive is that here's a man for the Lord. Here's a man in love. And that wants me, like that makes me want to love the Lord more. So the community is such an incredible witness. Like, and you really witness to each other before even witnessing to anyone else. Um, and it's awesome. Yeah, I am the way I am because of my friends and my brothers. You know, I imagine that almost answers the first question that he had, whether he's called to the Dominicans, just hearing about the life of a Dominican. Yeah. It's probably pretty inspiring. Yeah. And I think, too, like, part of where you end up is just, some of it's just, like, where were you born? Like, what parish do you come from? Or, like, who did you meet first? In a certain sense, it's like, how did you make your best friend? Like, ah. You don't know. Yeah, just you just kind of fell in point, with them. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, I wouldn't say, you know, you don't have to, like, look at every website of every religious congregation in the United States and then make a spreadsheet with, like, a macro <laughs> that, like, computes optimal holiness factors. It's just, like, a matter of, like, who do you love? And Some, what have yeah, you found? Sometimes a good question is, like, what do you want to do? Yeah. I remember when I was discerning marriage with my wife, I almost uh, played the voice of God asking me, well, do you want to marry her or not? I'm like, yeah. And God's like, well, buddy, hell, go and do it. <laughs> you know? But sometimes it's God's as simple Australian. as that. Yeah, he is. I had no idea. That's crazy. That'd be really disappointing if we get to heaven. He's like, well, I'm my good and faithful servant. <laughs> get stuffed. <laughs> if God doesn't sound like Morgan Freeman, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> um, but that's really important. Okay, so how, let's say there's someone out there right now and they have been discerning this for a while and they want to know, how do I contact? the Dominicans and, and how does that work? Can I come and visit them or what? Yeah, absolutely. You're most welcome to visit. I'm a son of the province of St. Joseph, which is based in the northeastern United States. So we have convents and priories throughout, you know, from like Kentucky to Maine, but the, the big places are New York and Washington, and that's where yeah. our vocation director is. So if you just pull up the website, um, opeast.org, you'll find the information of the vocation director, cool. and he's super generous with his time, and he'll talk to you on the phone and kind of let you know. East. O P as in order of preachers, east.org, all right. Yep, and then there are, there are, you know, there are other 
provinces throughout the United States. So we're like the eastern province, and then there's a central and south and west. Okay. Sometimes people go by geogra- like Do geographical. You have to? No. No. Um, yeah, because each kind of has its own character. Paul Binner says, and this is the final question, we have an assistant priest who occasionally expresses ha oh, ha, who occasionally expresses doubt about the real presence in his homilies, no less. Regardless, I've heard the priest has to have the intention of confecting the Eucharist for it to be effective. Is it possible it's not occurring? How can we be sure? So that's a really sad question, and uh, I'm sorry that Paul has experienced that in his, yeah, in his experience of the church. Um, so what is sufficient for validity is that the priest intends what the church intends. Right. Um, and that entails right faith, the kind of baseline right faith concerning the sacraments. And the real presence is an essential feature of our belief in you know, the sacrament of the Eucharist. Um, so I, the answer is I can't say. I don't know. I don't know how you can be sure because, um, yeah, it's a spiritual reality. So what would you recommend Paul do? Should he go tell the priest, maybe you need to kind of take some time out? Or um, I don't talk know to that... Bishop? I mean, this is a very serious thing. Yeah, so there is hierarchical recourse. You know, you can go to, if it's an assistant pastor, you would express that to the pastor first. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't feel comfortable talking to the assistant pastor himself, um, say, you know, for the good of the church, for the good of the worshiping congregation. <clears throat> and then if it's not addressed at that level, then you would just kind of go up uh, with hopes that it be addressed in due course. Mm. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, bit of a bummer. So we need to finish on a high note, Father. Mm. How do we do that? Um... Mm. We could talk about uh, anything else. Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. Do you no, really want to get Chick-fil-A? I do really want to get Chick-fil-A. Okay. We're here at the you epicenter have of Chick-fil-A. Are you staying Love. tonight in Atlanta? No, I'm leaving this afternoon. Oh, okay. Well, we better yeah. do that. All right. Thanks for being on. Cheers. Thanks for having me.